Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Halloween. Um, I am Councilmember Steve Levin. I am chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today we are joined by Council Members Barry Grudenchik, Brad Lander, Bob Holden, uh, Vanessa Gibson, I think, is here as well. Um, we expect other council members to join us. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here. Um, and, you know, I'm sensitive to the fact that it is Halloween and uh, we want to get people home to their children um, to go trick or treating, even if the weather is pretty dismal. But trick or, trick or treating still happens uh, when it's raining. So, um, so I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. So we'll, we'll, uh, we're, we apologize for the late start and we will. Uh, do our best to move this hearing along quickly. Um, today, the committee will be hearing nine bills and two resolutions related to child welfare, to the child welfare system in New York City. This legislation is intended to improve accountability through additional reporting and disclosure requirements for the agency, and to empower families in the system through accessibility to know their right to know to know your rights information and access to counsel. Our proposed legislation consists of intro. 1715 by Council Member Adrian Adams, and which would create a program to provide legal services for parents during the fair hearing process. Intro 1716, which is sponsored by Council Member Diana Ayala, which would require additional reporting requirements by ACS regarding emergency removal data and disaggregation by race, household income, and single parent status. Intro 1717 by Council Member Alika Ampre Samuel which would require similar reporting by ACS on race, ethnicity, and income levels of families, but apply to every step of the child welfare system process. Intro 1718 by Councilmember Margaret Chin, which would provide multilingual disclosure forms to parents during an investigation and contain know your rights information and resources available to families. Intro 1719, by, also by Councilmember Margaret Chin, would require reporting to the council by ACS regarding how long it takes for families to reach their children after placement or transfer, as well as how many children are placed outside of their home boroughs. Intro 1727, by myself, Councilmember Levin, would require ACS to report on emergency removal cases, which means the removal of a child out of a home prior to a court hearing when during the investigation of a report of abuse or neglect, ACS determines that such child is not safe at home. Intro 1728, also by myself, would create a legal services program for parents following the first contact of ACS with the family. Intro 1729, also by myself, would require that ACS provide parents regarding their rights to appeal, to expunge a case um, record after an indicated report following an investigation. Intro 1736 by Councilmember Rivera would require ACS to uh, orally disseminate Know Your Rights information about their rights at the initial contact at the start of an investigation. And Resolution 736 by Councilmember Lori Cumbo would, re would call upon the state and governor to develop a parental bill of rights to be distributed to families and posted online. And finally, Resolution 1066 by Councilmember Debbie Rose which would call on the state to reduce the length of time that parents, guardians, and caretakers can remain on the statewide registry list. An investigation conducted by Child Protective Services and the subsequent steps through the process can be very stressful and difficult for parents and children in the system. It is imperative that families have a fair and fully informed opportunity to make in decisions regarding their response to the agency's actions, which can have dire consequences for the family's future and the well-being of their children. Ensuring that information is sufficiently accessible and known to families, as well as a right to representation, will help the process become appropriately balanced. As advocates have stated, such steps as right to counsel can help reduce trauma for children as parents are more likely to cooperate and make necessary changes when they have the guidance and support of an attorney. The Council also seeks to address the racial and economic disparities in investigations conducted by the agency, with low-income black and Latino families comprising the majority, while 75 percent of the children in foster care are black and Latino, and only 6 percent of the children in the system are white. We know that New York State is one of only seven states, in addition to Washington, D.C., that has the lowest standard of some credible evidence for a case to be indicated and a parent or guardian to be put on the state central registry. 
Further, New York City has a relatively high indication rate at 40% compared to 20% nationwide. These bills seek to ensure that families in the system are aware of how to access the resources available to them and ensure that they have the support and guidance that they deserve in moving through the system. I want to thank my colleagues on the committee who are here today. Um, we've also been joined by Councilmember Richie Torres and Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Um, as well as all of the advocates, uh, the administration, Commissioner Hansel and his staff and commissioners for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from all of you on these critical issues today. I also want to thank my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, Elizabeth, uh, my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, and committee staff, Amanda Kilowan, um, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omery, policy analyst, and Daniel Krupp, finance analyst. And with that, um, I'll call up the first panel. We're going to hear from a, a, a panel of, of the public first. Uh, Nancy Fortunato of RISE, Hope Newton, Center for Family Representation, Ray Watson, also from RISE, and Joyce McMillan. So we'll, we will be setting the, the time limit at five minutes for testimony, um, just in, in the interest of making sure that we all are able to get to the trick-or-treating later. Whoever wants to begin. Hello? Okay. Ooh, okay, happy Halloween, everybody. I'm the senior parent leader of RISE. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about these important bills today. I'm here to support the City Council on calling on Governor Cuomo to sign the legislation related to the Central State Register to reduce the length of time of parents remaining on it and automatically expunge the records of parents who child abuse and neglect cases was dismissed. I also support the proposed bill to provide legal right to counsel for parents who are fighting those records with the state central registry to provide legal counsel, doing an investigation, and to require that the parent be informed of their rights. Without these changes, many families will not be able to get a job and flourish. If you want to keep children safe, you need to support parents from the beginning, not after you remove children from their homes and their families. We have a voice. We know what's best for our children. And we cannot keep allowing this system to dictate what's best for our children when they don't even know our children better than we do. Families are entitled to have clear information from the start and real support, no cookie cutouts. We need to change the narrative how this system view black and brown families. The agency needs to be accountable when they do violate parents' rights and needs to start pushing their perspective of what they think is best for us and our families. Every parent should have time, legally, representation at the beginning and inform of their rights, just like the Miranda, Miranda rights. When parents have investigation because of a call that went into Central State Registry, they automatically are criminalized and looked upon as monsters before anything had been, ha before anything had happened or anything been proven against them. ACS wants to dictate what's best for our children when we know what's best for our children. Many parents are coming in blindsided with no real guidance and no clear information from the start. It's really hard for parents to come to court and not feel like a criminal and not having a lawyer that could assist them from the very beginning, that's really hard. Parents have rights and that should be addressed at the very beginning of an investigation. Most parents feel powerless to fight a system that's bigger than they are and feel like they have no voice when they come in contact with the system. Legal representation for families and parents should not be overseen by ACS. 
it needs to be legally independent. We can't have the same system that's trying to remove our children be responsible for, for providing legal representation. I also want to say that we need to mobilize these packets of bill so that parents could be the best version of themselves, live their dreams, and have a better future for their family. The system cannot keep doing business as usual. It doesn't work anymore. ACS needs a big improvement, and with these bills, it can happen. It will happen. The agency needs to be transparent about the data on race, low-income parents and children living in poor communities with limited resources that are disproportionately impacted by ACS. Black and brown families should not be penalized for being poverty stricken. The city must pass these bills and provide more funding for resources in our community if they want to be intentionally about building up families and keeping children safe. We live in the most wealthiest city in the world, so why aren't we surviving and thriving? It's so important to reduce the fear of unnecessary investigation and removal and support parents' power. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Ray Watson. I'm here on behalf of RISE as a parent leader. Um, I'm part of a 70.1 70, 70 million estimated throughout this nation, part of two million with custodial rights. I'm part of a staggering 9% of that two million which have three or more children of dependent age in their care. I have four. I can't give a further percentage of the me's out there because of the aforementioned 9% of the two million. The information I can find on ifstudies.org only states that the majority of them are well-off Caucasian men. Thus, this means I'm an anomaly. I'm an African-American father with as many layers as there are shades of melanin within my culture. I'm a dad, and though it's implied, I am also a parent. The goal of my testimony today is hopefully to support and aid in the passing of the proposed law for provisions of counsel at first point of contact and the proposed law requiring child protective services to orally disseminate information about the parents' rights during their initial contact. See, in March 2016, ACS knocked on my door. This was the third time they were called in a week. You know, the ACS worker said that there was another case called on me, so I asked her for what and by who. She said, my children's mother called and said that I told her to smoke weed, then how to clean out her system. So I'm looking at the worker like, well, why are you here? They said that they wanted me to continue taking urine tests or to take more urine tests even somewhere else. So I had to further adjust my schedule, what I was doing for the three children that were in my home at the time, to take more urine tests than I was already taking. You know, I, I told them no and asked them to speak to a supervisor. When the supervisor called me, the supervisor then says, well, you know, you have our children inside of your home. So this woman that works for Child Protective Services told me that I have her children inside of my home. After a few choice words, you know, I, I asked the questions like, do you even know the names of their siblings? Do you know their ages, their favorite foods? You know, was that you who's been running around and taking them to the doctors and ripping and running to make ends meet and make meets end? And she couldn't answer, so I hung up on her. See, with three children on trial discharge, no concerns, bi-weekly urine tests, and even a foster care agency documenting that this is the best that my children had ever been doing since they had interaction with them, I knew I didn't have to comply. But see, this is in 2016. I caught my initial ACS case in 2007. So it took me 10 years to learn what I did and, have, and didn't have to comply to. But see, this is information that should have been given to me the same way the police Mirandarize people when they arrest them. This is again why I urge that you pass the provisions for counsel at point of contact and for all dissemination of a parent's rights during the initial contact. Because if I didn't know my rights, my children might have been in foster care for another 10 years. How many parents don't know their rights and their children will be stuck in foster care for another 10 years? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hello? Okay. 
Good morning, well, good afternoon. <laughs> I'd like to thank the New York City Council for having me here today. My name is Hope Lizette Newton. I am a parent advocate with the Center for Family Representation. I also serve on the board of directors of RISE Magazine, an organization that trains parents impacted by child welfare system how to write and speak about their experience. And I am also a member of the steering committee for Voices of Women, an organization that works to improve systems women and children go to when escaping domestic violence. I am a mother of three, now young adult children, awarded sole legal custody twice while navigating multiple systems, including family, family and criminal court. In 2006, the murder of Nix Marie Brown Gonzalez prompted reforms in child welfare. These reforms, which included how ACS approaches investigations, had a life-changing impact on my family. That same year, my husband and father of my children called in a false and malicious report to the New York State Central Registry. In the midst of a heated custody proceeding, he introduced my family to both family and criminal court. It was the first of many false and malicious reports called in to prove that I was an unfit mother. Prior to this case, no one in my family had contact with either of these systems. Unlike most parents investigated by ACS, I was able to hire a criminal attorney and had family resources to help me during my family and criminal court cases. Today, I recognize that as privilege. Even though it was a significant financial burden to me and my family, I was able to pay an attorney, go home, and back to work within less than 24 hours of turning myself into the authorities. That privilege did not protect me from ACS coming into my home as the legal enforcement agency with the right to interrogate my entire household and remove my children. If ACS has the right to come into my home and remove children, I should have the right to legal counsel to guide me through the process during the investigative stage of the case. As someone who successfully cleared their name through the New York State Central Registry, I know it would have changed the outcome. After my experience, I know now that the investigation is the start of this process. It lays the foundation for how a case is going to proceed. Parents are asked to engage in services that they may not need or that conflict with other obligations. They don't understand that they have the right to say no. Parents are usually in shock, frustrated, angry, and annoyed during the start of a case. Having someone present during an investigation to tell you how to protect your rights could change the trajectory of the case. It's beyond difficult to think when emotions are clouding judgment, which can result in decisions being made in a child removal. And for parents already engaged in services, addressing family challenges, having reached out to schools, doctors, and law enforcement for help only to have a case called in on them, especially a false and malicious report, the emotional response to the threat of a removal is high. The right to counsel at the earliest possible moment in the life of an investigation helps everyone focus on the right issues and leads to better communications to and for families. My criminal court case was dismissed and I was offered a six month adjournment in contemplation of dismissal in family court. Unfortunately, for the next nine years, the children's father called in several cases against me, all of which resulted in new investigations. I learned from each investigation, but looking back now, I believe having legal counsel present during all the investigations would have potentially cut the time, energy, and resources spent on false and malicious reports in half. Having someone present can help identify issues earlier on in the process and address them quickly and effectively. The work that I do now has offered me the opportunity to support families that are going through the child welfare system. Time and time again, the parents I work with talk about the fear that stays with them even after the ACS investigation. From the very beginning and throughout the entire investigation process, parental authority is being decimated. Parents often become paralyzed by fear when taking their child to the doctor or school because they are afraid that another case will be called in and result in their child being removed. The fear is real. 
and it makes it difficult for them to make the most basic parenting decisions. Having someone to walk you through the investigation and be with you during the first initial meetings can help a parent feel empowered and maintain confidence to parent their child in a positive manner. ACS investigations have the ability to inflict harm and can shred family bonds and undermine parental authority. It often feels as if, as though ACS takes advantage of the fact that disenfranchised black and brown families they investigate do not know that they can refuse to answer their questions or submit to the often intrusive nature of their request. Of their request. They come to their homes asking to speak to our children outside of our presence. They want to know how much food is in our cupboards and whether they can speak to our children's pediatricians. They want us to tell them everything, but don't even tell us what our rights are, sometimes even when they're there. In closing, all parents need legal counsel at the very beginning of an investigation to protect their families from unnecessary trauma. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. In the chambers, please. To approve, you could do this. <laughs> It'll get on the record. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joyce McMillan, and I am a Joyce, can your microphone's not on? Oh, I forgot to turn it on. You know, my voice is a little baritone. It's not necessarily needed. Okay. My name is Joyce McMillan, and I am an advocate working to abolish the current negative policies and practices and their impact on families in New York City and beyond by child welfare. My family and I were affected by child welfare in 1999, and that experience changed every relationship within my family, but especially the ones between myself and my children. Thank you to the New York City Council for the opportunity to submit testimony today about the need for the administration of children's services to be accountable to the community and the families they claim to serve. My hope is that this accountability package will bring balance in the interactions between ACS and the communities they are here to serve, but that they actually take advantage of and abuse. I know firsthand what they do because I was one of the families that it happened to. And I work with families every day who continue to experience the same abuse that I experienced and that my family experienced. The fact that we need the accountability package to legislate these common sense practices on behalf of communities highly impacted by ACS and their aggressive ways is quite disturbing. Like with the police, families fear and are terrified of ACS. It is more than concerning that ACS top officials still believe their employees are making great decisions when snatching children out of homes without court orders, and that they are protecting children even though the children in the care of ACS have the poorest outcomes. What ACS does to families and children under the guise of protecting children is completely outrageous, and for that, we should all be accountable. Because we all know what they do, we all know how they do it, and we all know how they get away with it. It is our responsibility to make sure it changes. It is not just the responsibility of people who have been affected by it. The responsibility of being a parent is a very serious responsibility and a difficult job. But the responsibility of being a parent with the lack of resources can make the job of being a parent even more difficult and can actually put children at risk. We look at the risk factors of leaving children at home when the home lacks needed resources without ever looking at the risk factors of separating a child from everyone, everything that they know and love and have become familiar with. Families who cannot afford legal representation is the population of families most affected by ACS. They bully their way into homes without acknowledging the family has the right to refuse them entry. Even calling the police and escalating the situation at times when there is no imminent risk. I would love to have the data and the reports to show how many children are removed without 
um, court orders, and I would love to have the data to show the abuse of children while in care. How many hospital visits for black eyes, for the rapes, and all of the other things that happen under the care of ACS that no one talks about or asks data for? Once in the home, ACS forced parents to sign HIPAAs, provide them copies of sensitive documentation like birth certificates, social security numbers, medical records, even when the case is not related to anything medical without ever advising the family that anything they say or provide a copy of could later be used against them. And I say later because with ACS, at any time, the case can change and be about something that they was not called to the house for because the only thing ACS wants is surveillance of a household so that they can investigate and find something. ACS chooses to focus on things that they were not called for because most of the time the things they were called for by the anonymous caller are things that don't actually exist. They were only things to antagonize the family. I'm grateful for the package, but this has to only be the beginning. There is so much for ACS to be accountable for, like how a family who complies with everything that ACS asks for and still never reached the point of unsupervised visits against the suggestion of licensed mental health practitioners without any explanation, just a veto from our commissioner. But through all of the mayhem caused by ACS, they always managed to find at least three children, at least three of them, who fared well. They exploit that child, putting them in papers, showing their pictures, talking about how well the system is. But that's only for about 3%. Can we talk about the other 97? I have a neighbor who was a foster child who is also doing well. She would never support ACS because she knows firsthand how she was treated as a foster child. She was just lucky enough to still be successful today. The real accountability is ensuring children remain at home with the proper support. That $10 million that we just spent to give every child in foster care a mentor could have went to the communities to provide the resources families are lacking. Like I said, we are all accountable. Spend your money to cut off the beast, not feed it. Thank you. Remember, no applause. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna thank you very much, this panel, for, um, for, for speaking um, your truth and telling your stories. Um, I know that that's not easy in a public setting, and so I, I uh, very much want to Thank you and um, set the tone. Thank you for setting the tone uh, for today's hearing um, in starting this conversation around what the reality is for, for parents, um, uh, many of whom um, have done nothing wrong whatsoever, um, to be on the receiving end of that knock on their door and what, and what that reality looks like. And so I wanna thank you so much for your testimony. I look forward to continuing to work with you after this hearing on this set of legislation um, to, to make sure that it is um, uh, the best legislation it can be. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we'll be calling up members of the administration now. Um, from ACS, Commissioner David Hansel, Assist Associate Commissioner Stephanie Gendel, Um, Nicole White, Assistant Commissioner Sandra Davidson, and Deputy Commissioner William Fletcher. And before you start your testimony, uh, I will ask um, counsel to the committee to swear you in. Yes, um, I think we'll, we'll be able to get you a chair, I think. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I, I, we had you, I'm sorry, we had you as a member of the administration. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> My apologies. You can join us. <laughs> 
please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. You may begin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Levin, members of the Committee on General Welfare. I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services, and with me today, to my left are William Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Child Protection, Sandra Davidson, Assistant Commissioner in DCP, and to my right, Stephanie Gendel, Acting Deputy Commissioner for the Division of External Affairs. Um, before we get, I do want to th also thank uh, the parents who just testified. Um, it was very powerful testimony. Um, we obviously don't always have the same perspective, but it is very important to us, as I'm going to talk about in my testimony, that we always listen to the voices of parents and children affected by the child welfare system. And so I very much appreciate uh, their being here and sharing their stories with us today. And we at ACS also appreciate this committee and the Progressive Caucus for focusing on the children, youth, and families who come to the attention of the child welfare system. We take very seriously our obligations to assess child safety and to provide families with the supports and services they need so that children can be safe in their homes whenever possible. At the same time, we recognize and respect parents' rights as well as their bonds with and love for their children. We also know that deep-rooted structural racism exists in our country and that the child welfare system has historically had a disproportionate impact on low-income families and communities of color. Since I joined ACS as commissioner, we have faced these issues directly by focusing on the safety of the children who come to our attention, by providing high-quality community-based services to families in need, by elevating the voices of family and community to inform and improve our work, and by continuing to shape New York City's child welfare system as a progressive national model that addresses historical disproportionalities. We're proud of the progress we've made, but there is much more to do, and we appreciate the Council's focus on these important issues. The bills that are the subject of this hearing reflect a set of core principles to which ACS is committed. Parents should be fully informed about the child protective investigative process at all stages. We should provide the supports to families that enable parents and caregivers to address challenges that affect children's well-being, and we should do so while keeping families together whenever safely possible. We must confront head-on the history of racial disproportionality in the child welfare system and ensure that we are treating all families equally. And we must listen to the perspectives of parents and others with lived experience in the child welfare system to inform our efforts to improve our work. I'd like to explain what we're doing in each of these areas before turning to the specific bills under consideration by the Council. Our child protective specialists are the first responders for keeping children safe and, su and supporting families 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When a concerned citizen or mandated reporter is worried about a child's safety, he or she calls the New York Statewide Central Registry, uh, commonly known as the SCR. And whenever the state accepts a report of alleged abuse or maltreatment regarding a New York City child, ACS is legally required by statute to conduct an investigation and assess the safety of that child. And in this past year, we investigated about 55,000 reports of abuse or neglect that involved about 90,000 children. We understand that when a child protective worker comes to a family's home, after there's been a report alleging possible abuse or neglect, it can be a very stressful event for parents, caregivers, and children. Our staff are highly trained to engage with families from a strengths-based perspective using trauma-informed techniques such as motivational interviewing. Core values of respect, empathy, and genuineness are reinforced with CPS throughout their training and in their daily practice. All of this helps us assess safety, lessen the stress of the child protective investigation, and partner with parents and families to best connect them as needed with services and supports. State social services law requires that after seeing to the safety of the child or children, ACS notify the subject of the report and other persons named in the report of the, in writing of the existence of the report and of their rights during and after the investigation. In addition, in addition to verbally explaining to parents why they're at home, at their home and why they need to see their children, Child Protective Staff give parents the state's uh, form called a Notice of Existence, which we're required to do, but we also provide the ACS Parents Guide, which I think you all have copies of, uh, at the very beginning of a Child Protective Investigation. The state-required Notice of Existence includes information about the investigative process, information about how to appeal at the end of an investigation, how to request a copy of the case record, and the contact information for the caseworker and their supervisor. In response to ACS's request, 
the state has made this form available in multiple languages, including New York City's 10 designated languages. Our parent guide, which is written in plain language, explains the child protective process to parents and caregivers, gives information about prevention services, explains the definitions of abuse and neglect, includes ACS caseworker contact information, and provides information on how to appeal if the report is indicated. The Parents Guide also informs parents about the ACS Office of Advocacy, which is a resource for parents, children, and others impacted by the child welfare system. As recommended by the Foster Care Task Force, ACS worked with providers, parents, and advocates to revise the guide to make it more user-friendly. And we are very thankful to the parents and the advocates whose feedback has been incorporated into the newly updated Parents Guide that we're including with our testimony today. In about 63% of the cases we investigate, we find no credible evidence of abuse or neglect. And in those cases, we unfound the case and we take no further action, although we may offer the family voluntary services. In the vast majority of investigations where we do identify safety concerns, we address them by connecting parents to services that can keep children safe at home. In most cases, ACS works with our community-based prevention service providers to deliver trauma-informed services like substance abuse counseling, domestic violence intervention, mental health services, so families can remain safely together. Our robust nationally recognized continuum of prevention services served almost 20,000 families with more than 45,000 children in fiscal year 2019. As a result of the unprecedented investment in prevention services, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the number of children in foster care in New York City to historically low levels, currently about 8,300, a big shift from about 50,000 25 years ago and about 16,000 10 years ago. Through the new set of prevention services and programs that we will implement next year, we will establish uniform access to every prevention model in every community citywide. Providers will be required to engage families, to incorporate their feedback, and to offer meaningful opportunities for their voices to shape the services they receive. The data show, and, and the chart is on page six of the testimony, the data show that our efforts to transform New York City child welfare are working. As you can see in the chart below, from fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2019, reports to the SCR from New York City, our indication rate in investigations, the number of children removed, the number of court filings by ACS, the number of new court-ordered supervision cases, and foster care entries all decreased, while the number of children receiving prevention services increased. In other words, we are identifying safety concerns and initiating court action and child removals in fewer cases while engaging more families in prevention services, trends that we hope and expect will continue in future years. Over the past 30 years, numerous studies have highlighted racial and ethnic disparities in the child welfare systems across the country and have generally shown that children of color are more likely to be reported, investigated, substantiated, and placed in care, and that they stay longer in care and are less likely to be reunified with their families. As data from the National Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System, the AFCAR system, shows racial and ethnic disparities in the child welfare system at each stage is a national issue, and it's an issue in New York City. Throughout my tenure as commissioner, it's been a central priority to address, address racial disproportionality and other inequities throughout ACS and to provide our staff with a deeper understanding of how implicit bias and institutional racism impact the way we engage with and provide services to families. The truth is, the causes of disproportionality and inequity are multiple and deeply rooted within the history and fabric of our country. The child welfare system does not exist in a vacuum, and it is connected to larger political, social, historical, and economic structures. We recognize that fundamental to the work of ACS is to help address the systemic inequities that affect our work and the families that we serve. It is crucial for us to build trust, engagement, and relationships in order to make a meaningful impact on disparities, infusing this across everything we do. And while I'm pleased to say that ACS is at the forefront nationally in tackling this issue head on, we have a great deal of work to do. 
we're addressing disproportionality through a comprehensive set of both internal and external activities. Internally, we've created institutional structures to focus our attention on these issues. We've developed implicit bias training programs for all of our staff, and we've developed and begun implementing an equity action plan, a plan that will allow us to measure our progress. Externally, we are investing in community-based strategies in historically marginalized neighborhoods to reduce child welfare involvement. We're addressing concerns about implicit or explicit bias in the reporting of possible maltreatment by mandated reporters. And we're supporting legislative reforms to reduce unnecessarily onerous impacts of the investigative system on low-income families and families of color. And I'd like to describe each of these activities in more detail because I think they're very important. We recently created an Office of Equity Strategies to provide focus and direction to our work in this area. The office leads ACS's efforts to develop and advance specific policies and practices that reduce disparities in outcomes for children and families that are the result of bias based on race, ethnicity, gender and gender expression, and or sexual orientation. Our data confirm that much like the national data, racial disproportionality exists in New York City's child welfare system. This begins with the racial composition of children and families that are reported to the SCR and that ACS is then obligated to investigate. And it continues through case indication, foster care placement, and length of stay in foster care. At all stages, there are disparities for children of color, particularly black and African American children and families. This does not mean that decisions made by mandated reporters or caseworkers or others are incorrect on individual cases, but it certainly means that more broadly, black families experience child welfare differently from white, Hispanic, and Asian families. As required by Local Law 174 of 2017, we developed an equity action plan as part of our commitment to confront and address the inequities identified in our equity assessment. The mayor's office released the equity action plans just last month, but we have many concrete actions already underway. For example, we've begun to take a deeper look into SCR reports in several pilot communities so that we can better understand the drivers as a first step toward developing partnerships with key stakeholders and mandated reporters. Our Workforce Institute developed its Understanding and Undoing Implicit Bias Learning Program to help staff identify the connection between institutional racism, structural inequity, and implicit bias, and to begin to service and address implicit bias in decision making and in conversations with coworkers. All child protective staff learn about implicit bias as part of the core training they take as they begin their jobs. All of our direct service employees and supervisors at ACS have now been required to take a new full day instructor-led program on implicit bias. And we've also launched a new e-learning course that is mandatory for all ACS employees to complete, including me. Child welfare agencies from other parts of the state and country have been reaching out to us to learn more about our implicit bias trainings so they can bring them to their jurisdictions. Our Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee includes a diverse representation of ACS staff, external stakeholders, and professionals who are committed to promoting racial equity throughout the child welfare, juvenile justice, and early care systems. Among other things, the committee informs policies, training, hiring practices, and program practice guidelines were needed to ensure continuity and sustainability in promoting fairness in process and equitable outcomes for children, families, and our staff. We are also focusing on the external factors that drive disproportionality in child welfare involvement. Our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing, created in 2017, is dedicated to making our communities stronger. We believe that a key approach to addressing disproportionality is through primary prevention, a strategy to invest in marginalized communities to prevent child welfare involvement in the first place. Some of the core components of our community-focused investment include our community partnership programs in 11 Hyde neighborhoods across the city, as well as our three family enrichment centers, which are open-door walk-in facilities which no, with no connection to other child welfare services. A major tenet of this work is a two-generation whole family engagement approach which recognizes the need to work together in the areas of education, economic security, social capital, and health to improve family well-being across generations. The community uh, partnership programs and the FECs are designed to promote family strength and stability by building community connections and helping families meet concrete needs. 
All programming in the FECs is community-led and designed with input from the community and from parent leaders. They offer parent cafes, where participants share personal experience and knowledge to identify ways to promote protective factors. Parents are engaged to lead these parent cafes, and program ideas arise from these, these discussions. And some of the programs that have resulted from the uh, uh, apparent uh, impact have been things like financial empowerment classes, mommy and me classes, stress release activities, family game nights, and many more. Our primary prevention work also includes strong efforts to inform families about important ways to keep children safe. We've provided information on safe storage of potentially dangerous medications, reducing fire hazards in homes, look before you lock to ensure that infants aren't left alone in cars, and of course, safe sleep for newborns and infants to help prevent accidental sleep-related infant deaths in New York City. In fact, today marks the end of Safe Sleep Awareness Month. This past year, the state passed a law banning crib bumper pads, which are dangerous because they increase the risk of suffocation. To help publicize the new law and to explain the danger of crib bumper pads and remind New Yorkers about safe sleep, we organized a crib bumper safe sleep swap for parents to, engage, to exchange crib bumpers for wearable blankets to safely keep babies warm. So while there's much more that we at ACS and in New York City can do to both strengthen the child welfare system and address disparities, there are also state budget, legislative, and policy barriers, making it critical for New York City to have a voice in Albany. This past year, many of our colleagues worked together to put forward a proposal to reform the SCR system, to heighten the indication rate in New York City, New York State, from some credible evidence to a fair preponderance of the evidence, which is more consistent with national practice, to reduce the length of time an individual with an indicated case remains on the register for employment screening purposes, and to expand the due process rights for those seeking to overturn or expunge an indicated case. We were pleased to see the passage of a bill aimed at bringing more fairness and equity to the child welfare system and reducing the collateral consequences of having an indicated SCR case, and we hope it will be signed into law. ACS will also be working at the state level to have training on implicit bias added to the mandated reporter training which is provided by the state. We believe it's imperative for the thousands of school personnel, medical personnel, law enforcement professionals, social workers, and others who are mandated reporters and from whom we receive the majority of reports to be aware of how implicit biases can impact decisions about reporting suspected abuse or neglect so that reports to the SCR are objective and result in help for children when truly needed. So with internal strategies, such as implicit bias training, affirming policies, and specific efforts to ensure that our services are culturally appropriate, along with external strategies, such as primary prevention and impacting state law, we're taking important steps to address the systemic issues that contribute to disproportionality. We do have, of course, a tremendous responsibility to serve children, parents, and the public. And for our efforts to be successful, we must build relationships with communities so we can provide the right services to the right families at the right time, both to prevent tragedies and to ensure that families have what they need long before there's a crisis. The only way for us to do this is to listen to, elevate, and incorporate the voices of parents, caregivers, and children, including those who are currently or previously have experienced a child protective investigation, participated in prevention services, served as foster parents, or who were in our foster care system. We've long understood and valued the role that parent advocates can play early on in our cases when parents come to the attention of our system and understandably have many questions and concerns. To provide support for parents during the initial child safety conference, where families and the ACS child protective team meet to develop a child safety plan, we contract with two community-based organizations to provide parent advocates. And those advocates draw on their extensive personal and professional experiences to support, counsel, and guide parents. This past spring, we achieved a new milestone with the addition of a new staff position at ACS, Parent Engagement Specialist, to increase the crucial work of empowering and engaging parents with lived experience in the design, development, and implementation of ACS policies and programming. Sabre Jackson, a highly experienced parent advocate with lived experience who previously worked at the Child Welfare Organizing Project and the Center for Family Representation, has served in this role since April. She's brought her wealth of experience and invaluable perspective to the agency, including 
She was spearheading a new Commissioner's Parent Advisory Council. And while we at ACS want to hear directly from parents and children, we also meet regularly with advocates and lawyers for children and parents so we can hear their concerns, their suggestions, and their feedback. We greatly value the roles that our colleagues play in bringing their expertise and experience to our, to, on the ground to our attention. We regularly engage in collaborative problem solving and believe strongly that these joint efforts benefit the children and families that we collectively serve. The interdisciplinary team approach that's used in New York City, actually was pioneered in New York City, with parent advocates working side by side with lawyers and social workers at the parent legal organizations, was recently evaluated and shown to decrease foster care length of stay. We're strongly encouraging other child welfare programs to adopt New York City's model of multidisciplinary parent and child representation, especially with new federal funding that's now available for that purpose. And as an example, I was part of a New York City delegation with representatives of the Family Court and the Center for Family Representation that provided guidance to child welfare leadership in Oakland, California on our representation model. So now let me turn to the legislation that's before this committee. The large package of bills that we're here to discuss today certainly shows that the Council shares our vision of ACS as the progressive child and family serving agency that we strive to be every day. I'll comment briefly on each of the bills and we look forward to working with you on them in more depth. Beginning with intro 1717, it would amend the administrative code of the City of New York to require ACS to produce an annual report of demographic information including race, ethnicity, race, ethnicity, gender and income level for each step in the child welfare system by parent and by child and then create a plan to address the disparities. As I previously mentioned, um, we have conducted a thorough data analysis and we have created an equity action plan. Um, we look forward to meeting with the bill sponsors and actually all members of the committee to discuss our current plan and to discuss the actions we have underway to address disparities in our system. Intros 1716 and 1727 would both amend Local Law 20 of 2006, uh, the Child Welfare Indicators Report created by that local law, to add a section on emergency removal data. Whenever possible, ACS seeks a court order prior to removing children from their families. As we discussed more fully at last November's hearing that was focused on child protective removals, if the CPS worker in consultation with his or her supervisor, manager, and deputy director believes that a child is at imminent and emergency risk of serious harm and there is not enough time to seek a court order in advance, the law authorizes CPS to conduct an emergency removal. This most often happens on weekends and at night when the court is closed and when there is no immediate intervention available to keep the children safe. We look forward to discussing the two proposed data reports on emergency removals with the council. Intro 1719 um, would also amend Local Law 20 of 2006, the report to add a new section for ACS to report on the length of time between a child and parent's first contact after the child enters foster care, and to report on the number of foster youth placed into care in their home borough. Family time is a key priority for ACS, and enhancing family time is an important recommendation from our foster care task force. We know that regular parent-child visits and contact can help minimize trauma and speed reunification. Given the importance of having the first parent-child visit within two days of foster care placement, which is our policy, I've directed my team to take a deep look into barriers that may inhibit this so that we can address them. Through this analysis, it's become clear that ACS is trying to accomplish many things in that two, initial two-day period. The parent-child visit, parent-to-parent -parent meetings between the foster parent and the birth parent, transition meetings between child protection staff and foster care agency staff, and also likely a court appearance. Aside from the mandatory court appearances, the parent-child visit is our top priority to meet within that two-day deadline. And so we're in the process of issuing revised guidance to ACS and agency staff that prioritizes the visit and that we hope will better ensure that children see their parents within two days of removal. We also recognize the need for ACS and agency staff to implement more standardized data entry practices within the state connection system so that we can track the first visit in a way that can be aggregated for monitoring purposes. As for borough-based placement, it is important to keep in mind that when children come into foster care, 
there are a number of considerations when determining the best placement. While we want to place children in their home boroughs, our first priority is to place children with either a family member or someone else the child knows well when they are available and willing. This preference for kinship placement, which research shows produces better outcomes for, young, for children and youth, is a key factor that sometimes often impacts whether or not a young person is placed in their home borough. ACS has focused on increasing placements with family members, and this past year, 40% of children and youth entering foster care were placed with kinship caregivers. We look forward to discussing this bill also with the sponsors. Intro 1728 would direct ACS subject to appropriation to contract for legal services for parents and caretakers immediately after the initial point of contact. The bill defines legal services to be brief assistance or full legal representation. As the Council is aware, and as I've, I've mentioned in my testimony, New York City has a nationally recognized model of multidisciplinary parent advocacy and representation, one which we hope will be widely replicated nationally with new federal funding. The institutional legal programs provide attorney and social work teams, along with access to parent advocates, for all cases as soon as legal action in family court is initiated. ACS and New York City have long supported their work, and they are funded through the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We strongly believe that parents and children should have legal representation once legal proceedings begin to ensure that their rights are protected and that the decisions of the family court are fully informed by all perspectives. We do have a number of questions and concerns about the provision of legal counsel to parents and caretakers at the first point of contact by ACS. We're concerned that this approach conflates investigative and legal processes in a way that could unnecessarily increase burdens on families, that it would expand litigation and family court involvement dramatically, and that it would require enormous financial and personnel resources to implement. The goals of our initial investigation are to understand what may or may not have happened to a child and to connect families to the services that they need. And those steps are dependent on our ability to engage parents and caretakers in a social work interaction. Invoking legal representation at this stage could undermine our ability to accomplish these steps. We also believe it could violate the state social services law confidentiality provisions if ACS was to inform a lawyer not yet representing a parent of the name and or address of a family about whom an SCR report was received. In situations of imminent danger to children, the involvement of an attorney at the beginning of an investigation who might feel obligated to minimize their client's risk and liability by advising a parent not to allow ACS into the home or see the child could create serious safety issues by slowing down the investigative process. It would also likely increase court filings as ACS would then be required to seek a court order to fulfill our legal obligations to assess child safety. The unintended consequences of this could be additional trauma for the children because NYPD accompanies ACS when entry orders are needed. These additional court filings and adversarial processes will likely impact thousands of cases that currently never need legal intervention as the majority of investigations are unfounded and only a fraction of indicated investigations result in a court petition. We conduct, as I mentioned earlier, about 55,000 investigations last year, and of course that's seven days a week and 24 hours a day, and if every parent or caretaker in the home and potentially ACS and the children were to have lawyers, every interaction could turn into a legal proceeding rather than a social work engagement, and it could create an explosive workload for attorneys and consume enormous financial resources. But we appreciate the need for parents to understand their legal rights and the investigative process. We also have an obligation to, attress, to assess child safety, and children have a right to be free from abuse or maltreatment, and we look forward to discussing with the Council ways to achieve all of these important goals. Intro 1715 would require ACS to establish a program to provide parents and persons legally responsible with access to legal services at fair hearings following an indicated report in an ACS investigation. We appreciate the desire for parents to have legal representation at fair hearings, which in this instance are a legal proceeding for a state hearing officer to determine whether ACS's determination to indicate a case shall stand or be overturned. Given the volume of legal services this bill would entail, 
we do believe it will be very expensive to implement, but we welcome further discussion with the bill sponsor. With regard to 1729, 1736, and 1718, we agree very much that parents and caretakers should have information at the earliest stage about the child protection investigative process, as well as their rights during an investigation, after a case has been indicated, and the resources available to them, all in a language they understand. I discussed earlier how ACS Child Protective staff are extensively trained on communications with parents at the initial point of contact. At that time, ACS gives, parent, gives parents both the state required notice of existence form and our parents guide, which as I mentioned was recently revised to incorporate suggestions we received from parents and other advocates. And they're both available in the 10 most common New York City languages. Um, you have the parents guide, so you know it also gives the parent information about our office of advocacy, which is available to them. When a case is indicated or unfounded, families receive a letter from the state which explains the case outcome and provides information on how to appeal or seek expungement. We also look forward to discussing these bills along with the information and documents we provide to families with the bill sponsors. So in conclusion, we know and we recognize that any child protective investigation can be an intrusive process. While we have a legal mandate to assess and protect child safety, we're mindful that government authority to take protective actions up to removing children from their parents in the most serious cases is an enormous responsibility. Balancing these two key matters, government intervention in families and protecting vulnerable children from harm is both the challenge and the core of the work of child welfare. And we do all of this within a system that we know disparately impacts different communities, particularly communities of color. I've talked today about the innovative ways that ACS is meeting this challenge, and we welcome the Council's partnership in this effort. We believe that raising the indication standard from some credible evidence to a fair preponderance of the evidence will help to better calibrate this balance. Within ACS, we continue to enhance training, supervision, monitoring, oversight, and assessment tools so that our child protective staff are equipped to make the best decisions possible when working with children and their families. And finally, with implicit bias training, with affirming policies and specific efforts to ensure that our services are culturally appropriate, we are working to reduce disproportionality and to build a 21st century child welfare system that better supports and strengthens all families. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm gonna ask my colleagues to ask questions first and then I'll come, I'll, uh, come around to my questions. Uh, first, I'll call on uh, Councilmember Barry Gredenchik and also acknowledge Councilmember Mark Traeger. And I also welcome uh, Councilmember Traeger and Holden to the committee. This is their first hearing as committee members, so welcome, guys. Um, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Gredenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, for the edification of the committee and, and for all those people who are here and may be watching, um, the panel that spoke before you, um, I, I think certainly spoke from the heart and certainly from experience. And I wonder if you could address, I know you were here and I appreciate your listening to them. I wonder if you could discuss that for a bit with us so um, we can understand a little better uh, how you feel about that. Because um, some of what I heard was, you know, discouraging. I, I have, um, enjoyed working with you as a member of this committee and I believe your heart is in the right place and that the agency has moved forward but I wonder if um, there's anything you'd like to say specifically to what um, they talked about this afternoon uh, yes councilmember thank you for the opportunity um, obviously it is um, sobering for us uh, to hear um, about the experiences that families have had with the system um, as I said uh, when I began, it is important for us to do that. Um, we know that we are not perfect as an institution. Uh, we do, as I said, 55,000 investigations a year. We strive um, to reach the right conclusion in each investigation, um, and we strive in, in every case to identify the needs that families have, uh, to identify the services that will help them meet those needs, and to work with families to keep children safely at home by providing those services. Um, and we do an enormous amount, and we've talked about this in some of the prior hearings, where I know you've been, been present, 
about our very intensive uh, continuous quality assurance work at ACS. Child staff, for example, which um, I think, as, as you know, uh, I revived when I became commissioner about two and a half years ago, um, with the specific focus of being very self-critical about how we do our work to make sure that we uh, are approaching families appropriately, that we're getting the right information, we're making the right decisions. Um, I will say, uh, I obviously, uh, I can't speak to the individual experiences of the four parents who testified. It did sound as though in, in a number of the uh, cases of what they, uh, what they spoke to, uh, their interactions with ACS were many years ago. Um, I would like to think that we are doing a better job now. I do believe in many ways we're doing a better job now. I do certainly know that we have um, made enormous expansions in both the scope and the quality of our prevention services. So I, I very much believe that we're in a better position today than we were five or 10 or 15 years ago, certainly, um, to, uh, to partner with families to make sure that they read the services that they need. But we have more work to do, and, um, and, and the reason why we've hired a parent engagement specialist at ACS for the first time, the reason we created a parent advisory council is to make sure that we're listening to the voices of parents um, every single day um, because we can't really understand our work if we don't understand the impact it's having on everyone who's involved with the child welfare system. I think the, the, the parent liaison um, will be critical to your work. I think it's a, it's a, a wonderful idea and I thank you uh, for being here again and listening to um, the parents who spoke today. Um, I'm married to a math professor, so I have to get into the math a little here. Um, you mentioned 55,000 reports, which is over 1,000 a week in New York City, 63% uh, of which are unfounded or found to be unfounded by uh, ACS. That still leaves us with over 20,000 or nearly 400 um, new cases every single week. Those numbers, I think, to every member of this committee and everybody sitting here are daunting. Um, unfortunate and disturbing to me. And um, how many caseworkers do you have again, just for our edification? Hi, William Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner. Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Division of Child Protection. So we have a, a workforce between CPS and the supervisory staff. We have roughly 3,050 3, um, workers who, who function in, in those positions. And just for my edification also, how long is it a tip? I don't know that there is a typical case, but on average, could you give us a ballpark estimate of how long a case might be open? Is it weeks, months? And I know I'm sure in case, some cases, many cases, it may be years. Sure, sure. So when it's a child protection investigation, the child protective specialist has up to 60 days to make a determination on the allegations that we received from the state central registry. Okay. All right, I thank you um, for your answers. And um, the last question that I have um, before I turn it back to the chairman, um, I don't know, one, one of the people who testified in the first panel um, either said or implied that there's no right to legal counsel. Did I hear that correctly? Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I would like to hear from the commissioner. I appreciate you being here. and I wanted to get more information from the commission. Sure, sure. Um, there is, a, parents and children um, both have a right to legal counsel at the initiation of legal proceedings. So as soon as a court, a case goes to family court, um, the, the judge will assign counsel and in most cases, uh, that will be one of the um, institutional providers who I mentioned in my testimony are the model that was pioneered in New York City which is a multidisciplinary model of attorneys and social workers and parent advocates, but it definitely includes attorneys. And so uh, both parents and children, because they have each have rights and their rights may or may not be uh, consistent, each of them is assigned an attorney at the initiation of legal proceedings. I think the issue that, uh, that the, well, there are two bills the council has proposed in this package today, um, one that would assign uh, or may authorize legal representation at the initiation of an investigation, the other that would authorize uh, legal counsel for fair hearings. And, uh, and I think those are the, the two issues that are before the council today. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, Councilmember Holden. 
Thanks, Commissioner, for your uh, incredible testimony uh, once again. Uh, just a few questions on um, who mostly reports abuse. Is it usually ex-spouse or is it um, a teacher? Do you have that? Um yes, and we have numbers here. It ac actually, most of the reports come from mandated reporters. Um, so just to give you some examples, in uh, fiscal year 2019, um, of, of all the reports that we received, about 23% came from educational personnel, which could be teachers or other uh, school officials. 18.5% um, uh, came from social services personnel, 13.8% from law enforcement, uh, about 12% from uh, other uh, reporters, uh, about 10% from medical or mental health staff, about 8% from friends or neighbors, um, and then the others uh, from other folks. So basically, I think in, in, in total, I think about two-thirds come from mandated reporters, people who are required to report if they see evidence of abuse or neglect, and about one-third come from uh, community members who, in, on their own initiative, are concerned enough to, to make a report. So uh, the implicit bias that we're seeing, that, that, that you have an office, uh, are you actually reaching out to that group uh, on a regular basis? or? We are. Um, we are indeed. We uh, at actually the hearing we had most recently before the General Welfare Committee uh, on the issue of marijuana, uh, we testified with health and hospitals. Many of our reports come from health and hospitals. So that's one uh, group of uh, mandated reporters that we're working with to make sure that they understand uh, what constitutes abuse and neglect, what the basis is to make a report to the SCR, um, and to make sure that they understand that reports should be made only when there's some evidence of impact on a child. Um, we're having the same conversations with the Department of Education. So yes, we are working with mandated reporters, some of the categories of mandated reporters from whom we frequently receive these reports. Okay, just so another, maybe two more questions. Uh, when you said there's a 40% placement, uh, kin kinship placement, is, what was that, is that, um, what was the figures before, in the years prior? We, when we began uh, a really concerted focus on kinship placement two years ago, at that point we were placing 31% of children uh, with either uh, family members or close friends. Um, today we're at about 40%. Our goal is to get to 46% by the middle of next year. Um, and we think this really will make an enormous difference in terms of minimizing trauma for, for, for children. Uh, we also think, uh, and again there's evidence of this as well, that it can help expedite reunification with families because kids are with people who are. But how are you doing that? I mean, th are you offering them an incentive, the, the kin or kinship, or are you going to other states now and cities which you didn't do before? No, no, this is all within, within the state. Um, what we do is when, uh, actually, uh, we, um, make sure that the uh, kinship caregivers receive exactly the same benefits and support that a non-relative foster parent would receive. So before they didn't, actually? Uh, before you were... No, they, they did. They, they did. did. Um, but uh, there wasn't... We didn't have such a concerted focus on identifying them as we do now. So, for example, both within the Division of Child Protection, when we anticipate that we are going to need to, to um, place a child in foster care, we begin immediately to try to identify family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, someone who may be willing to take uh, custody of that child for a period of time, and then if they are, and obviously they have to go through the same background checks as, uh, as any foster parent would, but if they're willing to do that, um, they, we then connect them with a foster care agency, and they receive the, the same support and the same financial benefits that a foster parent would receive. Great, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Holden. Councilmember Traeger. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin. I just, uh, s some of the data that, that I've heard just prompt, prompted me just to follow up on a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, you mentioned 55,000 uh, rep reports and investigations, is that correct, in, in the last year? We conducted 55,000 investigations in fiscal year 2019, that's correct. 55,000. And remind me again of the number of caseworkers in yep. ACS? Yes, we have. CPS, as well as a supervisory staff, we have roughly 3,000 um, staff in those positions. And of the 3,000, how many of them are licensed social workers? So we would have to get back to you with that number. I don't believe we have the numbers um, as it relates to um, how many have, you said licensed social clinical workers. social workers. Mm -hmm. So we would have to get back to you with that number. Yeah, because something that, you know, I'm going to use a DOE lingo. I used to be a teacher, mm -hmm. yes. sharing best practices. In the DOE, we have over 1.1 1. 1 million students. Mm -hmm. 
um, but only 1,300 social workers, uh, 2,900 guidance counselors, 560 school psychologists, but over 5,500 NYPD agents. So you have more NYPD agents than social workers, counselors, and psychologists combined. And now in this past budget, we did fight and prioritize the hiring of over 200 new social workers mm -hmm. for our school system, which will get us to 1,500. But that's still inadequate. And the reason why I'm adamant about social workers is because, first of all, it is one of the most honorable professions we have, I think, in the world. And they also know what they're doing. You need licensed personnel that knows what they're doing to follow up on these complex cases and to provide direct services to our children. Um, I am, would like to know, uh, Commissioner, if you have data with you at all, how, in your, how many employees in ACS today? ACS total? Yes. Uh, just slightly over 7,000. Over 7,000. And of the 7,000, how many social workers do you have working for you full time for your agency? Yeah, I don't know offhand. We, could, we can get you that information. I would really appreciate that information. Yeah. Because the city of New York has an urgent need to hire a big number of social workers mm -hmm. and to also pay them a fair w wage and salary, which they rightfully deserve. Uh, to take better care of our children of these cases because you can't just put s someone just to answer the phone. And if you're telling me that over 20% of the cases referred to ACS comes from DOE, and I'm sharing with you that a number of folks, I was a teacher, I was a mandated reporter, but I was not a social worker. And the training teachers receive to become teachers is inadequate, is inadequate in terms of looking for the signs of types of abuse and trauma and issues that our kids might be facing. And so I'm questioning the folks who refer cases, what is even their expertise in terms, and what kind of follow-up is done at the school level and at your level to address all the needs of our children. So I would like to get that data, Commissioner. I think it's very important, and we'll work with you. This council is not shy in prioritizing resources to hire more social workers in the city of New York. And I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank no, you, Chair. If I may say, I, I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, we very much value social workers at ACS. In fact, um, we will provide financial support to our staff uh, in order to go back to school and get a social work degree. And we work very closely with the New York City chapter of the NASW. So we uh, totally share your, your, uh, your, your views on that. And I would also would add that um, when we look at the entire system, we're not actually not just talking about our own staff, but of course all of our prevention agencies have their own staffs, many of whom are social workers, and our foster care agencies as well. So in a sense, you really have to look at the entire system because you're right um, to make sure that children and families are receiving the services they need. Uh, we need to have sufficiently trained staff at all stages right. of the process. What, what I'll share with you is that DOE will use an excuse that says, well, we'll work with some CBOs who might have a social worker on staff. What they don't share is that the social worker is the director of the non-for-profit, but not providing direct services to kids in the school. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't need more consultants. I don't, need, I don't need people that say that they're, I need licensed personnel that knows what they're doing at the front lines, helping directly serve kids. And CBOs have difficulty even maintaining social workers because they do require and deserve a good wage. Mm -hmm. And so we, in a $92 billion budget, should have the resources to hire social workers full-time and pay them a respectful wage and salary. Thank you, Chair, for your time. Thank you very much, Councilor Traeger. Um, okay, so I, I will, I'm, I'll, I'll keep my questions uh, as short as I can um, uh, in, in, uh, in deference to, to uh, uh, making sure that we get, get out of here on time. Um, so uh, I do want to ask a little bit about the right to counsel uh, legislation. And, and first off, just to you know, acknowledge that um, this, is, this presents a, a certain amount of tension within the, um, the, uh, the stated objectives of ACS. Uh, and I know that you know this as the, um, as the legal uh, 
a guardian to every child in care in New York City as ACS commissioner. Um, uh, and, and because uh, too many times every single year, um, a child known to ACS um, is killed at the hands of an abuser. That happens. That happens every year. Not just the cases that, uh, that get headlines, um, but other, other cases every, every single year. Um, and that, that presents um, an immense challenge to your staff, um, to CPS and supervisors and managers and, and directors and borough directors. Um, that uh, responsibility is um, paramount, and I know that, that, that's, that that's why people get into this field. It's not to um, make a lot of money. It's not to get public accolades. Um, when I visited a field office recently with you, um, when we were leaving at 6 p.m., almost every single CPS and supervisor was still at their desk. And so I appreciate that. I know that. Um, the question is, how do we, at this stage in the life of our city, um, get the public policy right to ensure the safety of children, looking to best practices around the country, outside the country, wherever, mm -hmm. um, while also fully, not just respecting, but, um, but really prioritizing the rights of parents to not have the state uh, unduly infringe on the relationship with their child. And that is, you know, that is sacrosanct. Above, you know, above all else for, for families, um, you know, the power of the state um, to intervene between you and your child is the most severe the most severe action that the, a state can take, basically. I, I can't think of any one more severe than maybe arbitrary arrest. Um, but that, that's it. it. Otherwise, breaking up a family, removing a child from their home uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the most um, draconian thing that a state mm -hmm. can do. So. How, are, how, do, how has this changed? How has this conversation changed in the, in the last few, few years? I mean, how have you seen it change? And where do you view ACS's role in that conversation? I guess that would be a place to start. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, let me begin by acknowledging you know, your point that there is, that the power that has been invested in us at ACS, which of course there is, we have an equivalent in every other part of, of this country and most of the world, mm -hmm. um, because we know that sometimes children uh, do face abuse and neglect at the hands of caretakers. The power that's been invested in us, I agree, is as extraordinary as any power that exists in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a government like ours. And it's something, that I and, and I know my colleagues take very, very seriously. Um, and we, I don't think we, any of us can ever be comfortable <laughs> um, and, and not be continuously self-questioning and self-critical about how we are exercising that power because it is so extraordinary. Um, and, and, and that's why, first of all, I have put so much emphasis on looking critically at our practice and, and, and identifying places where we didn't get it right and why we didn't get it right and what we can do in the future mm -hmm. to, uh, to address that. Um, and also making sure that we are listening to all other stakeholders in the process who uh, inevitably have different perspectives than we do on the actions that we, we take very often. Um, and we have to listen to them um, because we cannot be comfortable in, in, our, in our own view of our work. Um, 
So it is something we have to take very, very seriously. Um, in terms of, and you know, I, I also believe, as I said at the end of the testimony, that we do have a responsibility to make sure that parents understand the process from the beginning, that they understand what's gonna happen uh, to them, they understand what we are required to do by law, and, we and that they understand the options that they have. Um, and um, there are a number of things which I testified to that we're doing to try to make sure that parents have that information that they need. Um, but I think that too is a conversation that we need to continue to have ourselves and, and I'm happy to continue to have with you and, and the council about are there ways that we can better inform parents about, about the process and how it will unfold and what, uh, what options and opportunities they have. Um, fundamentally, you know, what I believe has changed and is changing is, uh, and we've talked about this many times uh, in these hearings, is that we are, while there, there will always be some situations where we need to intervene in a coercive way, because there always will be, as you ind indicated in your question, situations where, some situations where parents do not have the best interest of their children at heart and we have to intervene to protect them. Um, but what we are fundamentally trying to do is to change the nature of our interaction, our engagement with parents when we receive a report to one that focuses not, unless it's absolutely necessary, not on that, but focuses on uh, working with the parent to identify what's challenging them, what is it that's making it difficult for them, what led to this, and what can we do to help them mm -hmm. um, by, by providing the support and the resources that they need. And that's, I think, largely what we're focused on doing is, is, is everything we can to make the engagement one that helps us elicit the information and create a relationship with parents that allows us to help them achieve uh, what they want by, by connecting them with services and supports. Um, how do you achieve a reorientation like that in an agency that is a large and sprawling agency that has um, institutional um, kind of inst institutional prerogatives. I mean, I think that as a as an agency, you know, um, any city agency is not not eager to make you know wholesale changes. What what's the how does how does how do you even measure the success of efforts? Well, I think I mean sort of in terms of sort of process, you do it by um, having a strong management structure mm -hmm. um, in place um, so that you don't have individual decision making happening on the ground that isn't informed by the priorities of the organization. You have strong checks and balances um, around the exercise of the power so that it, again, it isn't something that's um, the result of, of individual decision making, but it's something that is um, has to be vetted up the chain sufficiently to make sure that, it, that the power is being exercised appropriately. You do it by having strong um, quality assurance reviews and checks in place so that you're constantly um, evaluating your own work against your policies and against your priorities. Um, and those are all the things we're trying to do. I mean, that's, to me, that, I mean, that's, those are things that are fundamental to management in any large organization, but I think they're particularly critical in an organization like ACS because of the nature of the work we do and the nature of the power that we, um, that we're um, authorized to exercise. And, you know, how we um, assess where we're doing, I think, you know, one is by looking at um, one of the outcomes that is important to us and that I, I'm proud of and I hope we will continue is reducing the number of children who are in foster care by reducing the number of cases that go to court, um, by reducing the number of situations in which we have to exercise um, more coercive powers rather than uh, working with families to achieve voluntary agreement around safety plans. Those are all the kinds of, of, of uh, metrics that really tell us whether we're achieving our goals and moving the directions in which we want to, to move. Um, and it, to the, uh, the point of metrics, there's in the, in the findings or the, the trends that you presented in your testimony, um, year to year all of the metrics are going down, which is in the right direction. There are the Article 10 filings, can you just speak to a little bit to what Article 10 filings are and those are significantly down from 15 and 16 percent? Yeah. 
those are, and I can ask my uh, DCP colleagues to speak in more detail, but those are basically situations where we go to family court requesting judicial intervention of some kind, which could be uh, either uh, remanding a child to foster care or much more often um, uh, asking the family court to exercise oversight uh, through a supervisory mechanism, court ordered supervision we call it, mm -hmm. um, to require the family to either participate in a service that we think is necessary, drug treatment, mental health services, whatever, um, requiring a family in a domestic violence situation, for example, to make sure that uh, an abuser remain, remains out of the home or does not interact with uh, the spouse or other children in a way that um, creates a, a risk to children. Um, so basically asking the court for some kind of intervention to address a safety risk that we feel unable to address just through the voluntary agreement with the family. And, that, and that's down 15, 16 percent from the prior year, from 18. Yes. Yes. And so um, now that went up significantly um, after Zamir Perkins, correct? That's, that's correct. The number, yeah, it did, and, and mostly it was around supervision, the supervision issue. Okay. Uh, there was a significant increase in uh, quarter supervision cases, yes. Do you remember how much? It was sizable. It was significant. We can get you yeah. the exact numbers, but yes, it was significant. Um, and you think that that is important to continue to in other words, it, with all of these metrics, you think it's important to, do you have uh, targets? Are they, is there, a, do you have goals in terms of how far you want to get those numbers down? No, um, and I don't think there's really a way to do that. You know, social dynamics change, uh, and of course the reports, you know, what comes to us, you know, is out of our control. So no, it's not that we have a, a particular target to meet. Um, but what we do, what we are committed to is expanding our ability to keep children safely at home without having court intervention wherever we can do that. And so, for example, I think we've talked about this in prior hearings, um, we have just in the last year added a new category of prevention services specifically as an alternative to going to court uh, and seeking court ordered supervision. And we actually have found um, it's a more intensive preventive service. Um, it is um, triggered uh, right at the stage of a, a child safety conference. And we have already successfully diverted hundreds of cases that would have otherwise gone to court seeking supervision to preventive services without requiring any court involvement at all. Um, with regard to mandated reporters, and this came up when I did the, the site visit at the, um, with, at the CPS office, the field office, um, they spoke about um, the implicit bias training that they received but mentioned that mandated reporters, these 55,000 cases that get called to the SCR, that they're not, that there's not implicit bias training there. I know you mentioned in your testimony um, adding that in. Who oversees that training for implicit bias, I mean for, uh, for mandated for reporters? The uh, State Office of Children and Family Services. Okay, so this was their decision to add No, 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 bias? no, no, no. They have not made a decision. Uh, what I said, and I have, to, I have to acknowledge you, Council Member, because you picked up on that right away in our visit to the Marcy Avenue office, and um, we've been thinking about it ever since then. And what we are going to begin to do is to advocate with the state. We don't have the authority to make okay, it happen. Okay, I see. But we're going to advocate with the state. Okay, um, and that's that's a huge endeavor. How many? How many? What's the universe of mandated reporters, numbers wise? It's I mean, oh, half a million people or something. Well, it's certainly tens and tens of thousands. I mean, we're talking about all school personnel in New York City, all medical personnel in New York City, social workers. Yes. To the council members' point. So it's yes, tens and tens of thousands of yeah. people. Um, I mean, that's something that we should be definitely looking at because. Um, the, the, as all, uh, if you look at the metrics in terms of uh, the number of children placed in, in care continues to go down, these other metrics continue to go down, the calls to SCR don't go down that much, right? I mean, as, as that, has it, uh, they have gone down some, that's in the chart actually. I, I mean, okay. well, investigations, essentially it's the same thing because we right. investigate every case. I mean, the state, there's a small number of cases the state doesn't accept and refer to us, but the vast, vast majority they do. So I think we said in there, investigations are down, we're down about 4%, I believe, from 5%. Okay. So that essentially is a reflection of, of about a 5% decrease in SCR calls okay. from one year to another. Okay. Um, so on, on to the issue of, of right to counsel. So just to be clear, a parent has the right to an attorney you know, from the first knock on the door, correct? I mean, not not a not a right to a um, 
a court appointed attorney, but a, a right they could call an attorney themselves. Yes. Right. Um, and in practice, if a parent does do that, what what is the consequence that in practice that of, of that? Does it does it mm -hmm. change the the case uh, in reality? Does it does it afford them, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of knowledge of their rights through the process that they might not otherwise have? Um, what do we see when that is invoked? Mm -hmm. Well, let me say a few things, and then my, my DCP colleagues may want to uh, elaborate. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is it doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, it is rare that uh, a family, any family, um, seeks legal counsel or representation at the beginning of an investigation. Um, and our experience is that the vast majority of families uh, cooperate with investigations, um, you know, talk to us, allow us to observe the children as we're legally required to do, and will engage with us around what their service needs may be. Um, and so, you know, the number of the situations where we actually have to go to family court, which is, which actually, again, if we cannot observe the children um, or visit the home if we need to, um, it's our ob obligation to go to court and get an order to do that. But that happens very, very rarely. Um, I mean, really, fewer than 1% of investigations, um, much fewer than 1% of investigations. So it, it really doesn't happen very much. Um, Is that because families don't know that they're allowed to? Or I, because they I, don't have the resources maybe to hire a lawyer privately? I, don't, I, I can't say that would be really speculation. I don't know why it doesn't happen. Um, but, and I'm not sure if also if we really have the information to sort of talk about how the process is, is impacted when families do have lawyers, but maybe William or Sandra, you might have. Good afternoon, Assistant Commissioner Sandra Davidson. Hi. Um, so with respect to how we assess child safety, regardless of a parent's ability or inability to contact a lawyer at the front door, it doesn't change our legal mandate to assess safety mm -hmm. of the child. Um, and in discussions, um, if there's legal representation at the front door, the conversation with families moves from a social work conversation around what may have contributed to the reasons for the case getting called in to a more legal conversation, um, which may prevent families from learning about the vast resources that we have to help them support their families. Right. It would also possibly contribute to an increase in court filings and other government entities enter their life, which may not have otherwise been needed. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, the, if I understand it correctly, I mean, ACS's perspective on this is that it, um, just to paraphrase what you just said, that it changes the dynamic from a social work perspective to an, an adversarial legal relationship. Is that right? A social work relationship to, a, to an adversarial legal relationship. To a legal conversation. Right. Okay. Because. I think from the parents' perspective, um, from what I have heard, um, very often they perceive the relationship to be adversarial at the get-go. Mm -hmm. And so that, so the, you know, I, there's, there seems to be a difference in, and, and what the relation, in an understanding of what the relationship is between the parent and ACS. Um, and if they feel that the relationship is adversarial from the get go, um, you know, in, that's, that's the reality that they're working with. Um, and I mean, even, so for example, I mean, I just did a, I did the a search of the, um, of uh, the uh, flyer that the that that we have the Ch the parents' guide to child protective services in New York, um, and nowhere in the flyer does it say affirmatively you do have a right to hire your own attorney at any time. It says you you can be a, you know once it's in court you can you can. Um, You'll, you have the right to be appointed an attorney if you can't afford one. Um, but there's nowhere in here, if, if you're giving this, if a, if a CPS gives this flyer to somebody, 
He says, you know, read this while I'm here. Um, nowhere in there would they get the sense that, you know, I have a right to an attorney um, if I want to. If I want to do that, I'm allowed to do that. And it's obviously, I mean, just going back to my first question with the commissioner, the, the, the power dynamic between the state who has the ability to take your child away from you and a parent who is absolutely at the mercy of the state in that situation, that power dynamic is as asymmetrical as any that I can imagine. And a parent in that situation is as vulnerable as any person uh, that I can imagine. Um, it, I think that kind of the clarity there is kind of lost, and, and, there's, and so they're, they're immediately, not just in an adversarial relationship, but in a kind of survival mode. I mean, I don't think anyone has done a, a, um, a psychological study on what the psychological state is of a parent when ACS knocks on the door, but I imagine, you know, panic sets in, flight or flight, um, you know, just a desire to, you know, immediately uh, um, try to, def you know, uh, make the situation go away or as, po as immediately as possible. And so, you know, they may agree to things that they ought not agree to or aren't required to agree to. Um, so, I mean, I think that in terms of the kind of self-examination, I mean, I think that examining not just the, I mean, it's, I think it's important to examine um, systemic racism, um, implicit bias, um, all those things, but, but really just the, the actual psychological state of somebody getting a, a knock on the door from ACS, I think is um, something that we need to be looking at more. Um, but in terms of how are we informing people of their right to, the, just, just their basic right. I mean, is that something that ACS has an issue with? Of just, I mean, I know that ACS has an issue with maybe supplying the lawyer or paying for the lawyer, but, um, but telling people, you know you have a right to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, the, the parent's guide that we've shared with you today is, is new. It was developed. Um, it was actually in response to the recommendation from the Foster Care Task Force that we modify it. Um, and we consulted with a lot of stakeholders in doing that. But, um, you know, if, it, if there's content that we should discuss uh, that's not included here or that should be changed, that's certainly something that we're, we're willing to talk about. So, I, you know, as I said in the testimony, I, we certainly believe as a matter of principle that parents should be fully informed of their rights. And if there are modifications that would help us do that better, we're happy to talk about them. Um, it was. It came up in uh, Joyce McMillan's testimony before, just about the the data on um, the number of children removed prior to a court order. So emergency removals. That data we have, right? Is that yes? And that's yes, your, we shared that I think in the last hearing in November. And that's and that's on the MMR. And we, can, we uh, and it is it, it's in the fla uh, flash. It's in our flash report, okay. our monthly flash report. Um, and then the number of abuse cases for children while in foster care is that. That is in the MMR. That's in the MMR. Okay. In the mayor's management report. Um, the issue you mentioned um, parent advocates or other third party um, advocates. Um, how is that? You mentioned a partnership with Rise and hiring somebody from, from CWAP. And um, I'll just share with you anecdotally, I sat in on a court hearing once um, in family court and um, and the and, and the issue of um, it, it came up in court and the issue of um, CWAP being a location for a visitation and the one of the attorneys mentioned that they're you know they're no good they're not a good organization. They are confrontational to ACS, um, and therefore, that is a that is they're not they that was an indication of of you know lack of whatever from the parent. It was but that was that came that was in a family court hearing with a with an ACS attorney present, 
a legal aid attorney representing the children. Um, and it struck me that nobody in the courtroom was acknowledging that there's a role for a third party advocate uh, in this process. I mean, it was almost seen as, as a demerit in the case. Um, and I don't want to characterize the judge's opinion on it. I'm not trying to characterize really the, the um, uh, what they said exactly. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not judging what they said exactly, other than to just say, it didn't seem as if the idea of, third, of a third party advocate was an accepted uh, presence in this process. Hmm. Well, obviously I can't speak to that yeah. situation, but yeah. it's surprising to hear only in that um, the, um, all of the institutional provider organizations that we work with, that Mock J contracts with, and that go into court, uh, family court every single day have parent advocates as part of their representation model. So it would be surprising to me that a family court judge wouldn't be aware of that and that there would be any resistance to that happening. It's a, it's a fundamental part of, of uh, the representation of parents in all family court proceedings, with the exception of Staten Island, uh, which does not have an institutional provider. Okay. <laughs> now, and so, okay, so the, the role of third party advocates uh, in the process is, um, because parent, you said parent advocates are, are, are working for ACS, or they're ACS employees? No, 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 well, no not necessarily. We, we contract for some of them, and they do a number of different things within our system. Mm -hmm. They provide training to our staff around sensitivity to parents' issues and parents' rights. Uh, they participate in child safety conferences on behalf of parents. So while they're not employed by us, uh, the ones we contract with do have a number of different roles within the ACS process. Uh, but then the legal provider organizations also have their own parent advocates on staff who are part of their multidisciplinary representation model when they are representing parents in family court proceedings. In a child, okay, but, but not before that or not before obviously they the, 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 the um, third party uh, advocate is present at a child safety conference um, and that's the first point at which they're present? Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and it's interesting because the, the teams in the borough office feel and understand the value of having that third voice, um, having that, that parent advocate um, to be there to help inform around the process for the parent. Um, you know, we have a whole um, mechanism in place um, where we reach out if they're not on site for that particular morning. Um, you know, we will hold up the child safety conference, mm -hmm. um, not too long, but we hold it up um, so that the parent advocate could be present if the parent agrees. Right. Is there an issue around, and I've heard this brought up in the past, around just a conflict of interest with the contract for the third party providers being in ACS, having just a either appearance of conflict or a conflict itself? Um, in that dynamic because their, in some sense, their contract is, is at the discretion of ACS. Is there, a, or is, does it make sense for that to not be in ACS, that contract to be uh, in Mach J with um, the same place that the legal service provider's contract is? Um, that's an issue that actually never has been presented to me. It's something to think about, I guess. I mean, my, my initial reaction is, is their role is very different from an attorney's role where they're actually representing a litigant in a proceeding. Right. Um, so I'm not sure, but it's an interesting question. I'm happy to think about it and, and talk with you about it further. It's, it's something that I've just, I've heard over the years. Um, so, so um, before Child Safety Conference, there is another interaction with parents, correct? There's a, um, during an investigation, there's, uh, In the process of an investigation, uh, investigation is opened. During the course of that investigation, um, what steps are there where there's a um, uh, where parents are called in, or there's uh, interactions with parents? 
So I think you're referring to a family team meeting? Yes, right. Which is under the continuum of multiple family team conferencing that we have. Mm -hmm. Family team meetings, the goal of that is to bring all families together um, and their service providers and the child protective team to discuss what the safety issues are, uh, the service goals, um, so that everyone can come together and really support the family in partnership so that they can no longer need child protective services and they can more work with the community partners. So then that is, that, but that's during an investigation, not to whether, it, it hasn't been determined whether a case is indicated or not? Correct. Um, and the parent is at that meeting? Yes. Um, okay, sorry, I'm hearing people say that they're not, they're, you're, the parent is there at that meeting? Yes. Um, can, would it, would it, if a parent were to have um, it, it, a, a, um, a child advocate or a parent advocate is not there at that meeting. A parent advocate is not there at that meeting because it's not a child safety conference. Right. A uh, parent can call our Office of Advocacy and talk about what their rights are in terms of who they can bring to a family team meeting. But again, that's more of a, it's a social work conversation to develop a service plan. Um, and having, um, So this is this, sorry. This is the 1028 hearing. No, that's a different no, hearing. That's different. 1028 hearing is a court proceeding, court proceeding. after an Article 10 petition has been filed. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Um, so at okay. So at but at this hearing, it's a family team. Is that what you said? A family team. Right. Family team. Not a hearing. Not a hearing. Uh, a hearing. family team meeting. Is there is there a um, does ACS see a potential problem in having an advocate? for the parent present at that meeting? So I think it's something that we can revisit mm -hmm. um, because again, as, as um, Assistant Commissioner Sandy Davidson noted, that it is a social work conference and it's a conference where you're talking about develop, the development of a service plan based on the needs of the family, mm -hmm. right? To mitigate some of the risk concerns, right? And ultimately, it helps to keep children at home, right, by mitigating those risks. Um, but it's something we could revisit, yeah. definitely. Again, it has, to, you know, it's, it, because of the managing the, that, dy again, it goes back to that dynamic of, of that mm -hmm. entirely asymmetric, asymmetrical dyna dynamic between the state and the individual in this particular instance. Um, you know, it, again, like, even just trying to, know what's going on with with uh, e you know, enormous amount of adrenaline and fear and sure. um, running through running through your mind I imagine that it w it's it's hard to make clear and informed decisions for anybody right? yeah um, what I might add um, and my colleagues will, will kick me under the table if I get this wrong but I, I don't think I will you know the difference I think the distinguishing family team meetings and child safety conferences is as you, as you noted uh, chair that Family team meeting takes place before we have made a decision about indication. We haven't decided there's a safety risk. It's just yep. we want to engage the, the parent. Child safety conference takes place when we have identified a safety concern. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get the parent to agree on a safety plan so that we don't have to go to any kind of court or other kind of course of intervention. And so the reason why we think parent advocates are particularly valuable there is because they can advise parents about Mm -hmm. the, the benefits of doing that, maybe from their own personal experience or from their, their professional involvement in, in organizations. Um, we think it's really useful for them to be there to talk with and work with parents around the benefits of work, working with us to safety plan for their children so they can keep the children safely at home. Right. Mm -hmm. So it really is a fundamentally different goal. Right. Um, that said, there's there's still a role for somebody to have some assistance or help so that they're not yes. on their own there. Mm -hmm. Again, they're just, in, even just by numbers, they're outnumbered by mm -hmm. representatives of the state. Yeah, yeah. and I do think um, that family team meetings often do involve other yeah. family members oh, yes. and people aside from the parents. So it's, it's certainly not unprecedented to have people other than the parents at a family right. team meeting. Mm -hmm. um, In the legislation on, on Bill 1728, um, when we talk about legal services, 
Um, we define it as brief legal services, meaning in, in from the text of the, the bill, meaning means individualized legal assistance provided in a single consultation by a designated organization to a covered individual in connection with a covered proceeding. Um, that is, you know, that's, that's short of full-on legal representation. Um, it is a, it is a kind of a first point of contact with uh, a legal services provider that can help somebody navigate that process and, and assure their, their legal rights. Is that, is that something that is um, in and of itself concerning? I mean, it's, in other words, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not that you, this doesn't indicate that you, they would even have a full right to, a, to legal representation at the outset. It's, right. it's, a, it's about kind of a, somebody outside of this established relationship now advising you on your legal rights. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something we probably should have more conversations with you about to make sure we understand the council's intent because in that, um, in that bill, right, the definition of legal services is brief legal assistance or full legal representation. So, uh, and then in the provision, it, it talks about what sounds like we, th we understood to contemplate uh, more extensive involvement of attorneys. Okay, right, right. Um, Um, and you know, the current language of the bill um, it, uh, describes the covered proceeding as, as, an, as a, upon indication of a report. Um, we've heard from advocates that that should be going, you know, that that should be going back further in time to the, to the first point of contact with ACS. Does, does ACS have an opinion about um, having legal representation guaranteed uh, right when a case is indicated? As it is now, that's, that's not too far from when a person has legal representation when they set foot into court. Well, it depends. It depends on what happens in the investigation. I mean, in some cases, uh, in the case of, for example, emergency removals, the case would go to court long before there's an indication. Um, it mm -hmm. would happen usually very early in the investigation. In other cases, it might happen after. So there's no um, there isn't a uniformity in terms of the relationship between when a case is indicated and when court action might be um, initiated. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard to answer that question. But since, the, again, the bill draft, we, and we were not frankly quite sure what the council meant since it does talk mm -hmm. about both per, first point of contact and following an indicated report. We weren't quite sure what the council intended there. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and we would we clarify took, we that. Took, we took first point of contact yes. and first point of first contact. contact. Okay, so we would, we would um, further define that in, in any subsequent drafts. Um, okay. Um, you mentioned in your testimony um, the uh, Parent Advisory Council and the Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee. Um, these are these are both new. Is that right? No. Uh, the Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee has been in existence for many years. Okay. Uh, it is not new. Uh, the Parent Advisory Council. I believe that there was years ago a Parent Advisory Council, um, but we have just reconstituted it. Um, and I've just uh, actually had my first meeting with its steering committee about a month ago, and we'll be meeting with the council on a regular basis. So that is new. Um, is it possible for the minutes of those meetings or the agendas of those meetings to be um, made public or shared with us at the council so that we kind of have a better sense as to what the uh, ongoing objectives are of those committees or and, and councils? Um, let, us, let us take a look at that. I don't want to give an answer off the cuff, but we'll take a look at it. Okay. It would be, it would be helpful, I think, from our perspective to kind of know where it's going. Sure. Yeah. Um, um, just a few kind of uh, 
more process questions. If a parent refuses the entry of a CPS, what are the next steps taken? If, if short of, if there's not a emergency removal um, that is deemed warranted, then what is the next step in that case? Mm -hmm. um, if a parent refuses us entry into a home, we want to be able to at least see the children and we'll ask a parent, can you bring the children to the door to at least observe the child to make sure that the child's not in imminent serious harm. Mm -hmm. After that, we'll have conversations with the parents around what we would like to do with the family and have conversations and what we can afford the family for services. If the family continues to not allow us entry into the home or access to the children, we have a legal obligation to reach out to our family court legal partners to discuss and consult with them what our next steps are, which potentially could be an entry order or a warrant to produce the child. And we inform the parents of that verbally and in writing mm -hmm. about what the next steps would be if, in fact, we continue to not have entry into the home or observe the children. So they get a court, a court ordered warrant to enter the home. Yes. Um, and, how, and how quickly is that obtained in practice? Depends on the severity of the allegation. If the, if the concerns, the safety concerns of the child as such, we would consult our FCLS con attorneys that day and ask them for any opportunities if the courts are open for an entry order on that day or warrant to produce a child. Is, if, that, is that ever, if the courts aren't open, is that ever a reason cited for an emergency removal? In other words, if, they, if, they, if, there's, no, if there's no court to get the warrant from, um, does, does uh, ACS wait till the next day until the courts are open to get the warrant, or do they try to get an emergency removal yeah. to be on the safe side? So you can always get a judge on the phone 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You can okay. always have a consult with the judge as to whether or not. But again, it determines the concerns of the safety of the child. If we receive a report that a child's life is in imminent danger, mm -hmm. then we're going to get the courts on the phone, have mm -hmm. consults with our supervision. It's an allegation of neglect that won't happen. We'll have consultation um, and then make decisions on next steps. Mm -hmm. It also depends on the time of the day. Um, if there's opportunities to, if it's in the morning, maybe have conversations with the family and say, can we come back later at night at a better time? Mm -hmm. um, but it's always with the best interests of the child and having conversations with the parents about what our legal mandates are and providing them opportunities to understand that. Right, the overall, the overall goal of the CPS is to continue to engage the family. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned if it's very high risk, right? So the path may be a little different, mm -hmm. but if it's not so high risk, we will also try and engage the family by saying, okay, can you come into the office? Bring the children into the office. And then we continue to engage. We continue to talk about the need and why that we need to get out to the home to see the home as well. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, it's still around and trying to engage the family, mm -hmm. not creating that adversarial um, relationship. Because we wanna be able to assess, to see what resources we can um, provide for the family so they flourish. That's important. That's the overall goal. Um, we can ask a few questions about preventive services, if that's all right. Is, um, how many families are entering preventive services voluntarily each year? Do we have that? Mm -hmm. um, in total, about 80% of preventive services are voluntary, and about 20% are court mandated or under court supervision. Um, and what's the process? Are there particular forms a parent has to sign to do that? There are. <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, the parent has to uh, acknowledge, and part of it is because we, you know, this is a sort of state requirement um, as part of the, the fact that we're, we're doing this as a safety intervention for the parents and also that um, make sure that the funding is available to support the service. But there, there definitely is an engagement process that the parents have to go through mm -hmm. to initiate prevention services. Yeah, there's an application for services that the parent signs. Okay. That they're agreeing to the services. Is there any concern program. that parents are not signing that due to issues around public charge right now? 
Is that something that we're noticing or seeing? Uh, we're certainly concerned about it. We're concerned about, about families uh, with immigration issues not accessing services of all kinds. We don't have you know, solid data showing it's happening, uh, but we are hearing some stories about it, and so we, yes, we are very concerned about that. Um, in terms of family enrichment centers, um, are they allowed to deny service to anybody based on their geography? Or if they walk in the door, because I know there are catchment areas, if somebody walks in the door, they're not going to be refused services? I see. No, they will not be refused services. Um, and does staff there have, do they have the resources available to, to kind of do intensive um, uh, case management with families, so taking them to appointments or um, you know, uh, coordinating uh, medical provision or that kind of stuff. This is Stephanie Gendel. Um, so no, they don't do in case of intensive case management, but nor are they set up to do that. Um, that's a different type of service, and this is really more of a community support. Um, if someone came in who was in need of intensive case management, they could refer them to such a service. Um, so I'm going to jump around just a little bit here as I wrap up. Um, there was the, a, a DOI investigation from last year that identified issues within the uh, ACS's Emerging Children's Services unit, which is the, the unit that handles nights and weekends and holidays. DOI found that there was inadequate staffing, case practice, supervision, and training within the unit. What has ACS done since then to correct these issues? Um, well, I don't know there was necessarily a response to the DOI investigation, but we've done a great deal. Uh, it's our emergency children's services unit, uh, which does have coverage uh, on nights and weekends for the city um, and receives and investigates reports. Um, we have expanded staffing there significantly, very significantly. We can, we can get you numbers on that if you'd like. Um, we also, over the last couple of years, have created an applications unit there um, so that now we have the same capacity at ECS as we, ne as we have had in the borough offices to do background clearances when a report comes in so we can get, you know, the history of the family um, and enough information to inform our, the investigation that we're doing. Um, we've expanded the number of investigative consultants who are assigned to ECS, so we have done a great deal to expand capacity of ECS. And then, sorry, with the last, uh, last question I'll have on, on knowing, on the Know Your Rights legislation, so intros uh, 1718, 1729, and 1736, um, does so ACS does not have an issue with fully inf in informing parents of their full rights at the outset of an investigation. Is, is that, I just want to be clear on that. No, in principle, we don't. Um, we, you know, as we read the legislation, we think we're doing most of what the legislation would require, but this is a conversation that we would uh, look mm -hmm. forward to having with you mm -hmm. to see if there are additional things that we should be doing. Okay. I mean, do you, do you think that parents do know that they have a right to an attorney at that outset? I mean, is, is, is that, um, I mean, in practice, do you think that parents realize that that's the case? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But, um, but you wouldn't kind of at, at uh, you wouldn't full stop have a problem with requiring ACS to provide parents with that information. We'd certainly be happy to talk about it. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here and for your time and for your uh, testimony answering our questions. Um, uh, we do want to get everybody out of here and home for <laughs> Halloween. So. Um, Really appreciate the time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call up first panel. Um, I'm going to call up Susan Chin and Michelle Ayakampon. I, I can't. I, say it. Asia Pong. Thank you, Michelle.
Thanks so much. Whoever wants to begin. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on intro 1728. My name is Susan Chin, and I am the assistant director in the political action department of DC 37. I am joined here today by Michelle Champong, vice president of political action of local 371 SSEU, as well as Vincent Gigarello, uh, former CPS worker, as well as a supervisor in the um, CPS. We are here today representing Anthony Wells, president of local 371, DC 37's second largest local with a membership of 20,000 members, which includes close to 3,000 workers that would be affected by intro 1728. Our workers are on the front lines every day, actively going to places where our vulnerable children are and ensuring all children in this city are safe, healthy, and given all the opportunities that they deserve. These workers embody the true spirit of public service, fighting for those who cannot fight for themselves. In spite of challenges big and small, our workers transcend these difficulties and protect our children in vulnerable conditions when their caretakers fail to do so. We applaud this council's efforts to improve rights and services for all New Yorkers, including universal legal representation in housing courts and expansion of immigrant services to strengthening health care and improving city services. To be abundantly clear, we do not oppose the principle behind expanding legal representation. We celebrate the intent of this body's proactive measure to bolster and create additional protections for those who are in need. In fact, as a union, we hold representation as a sacred right, and our workers exercise this right every day. However, we are concerned with the unintended consequences of this bill, intro 1728, that may negatively impact the welfare of children. We are also seeking clarification of the language on this bill. There is a comprehensive set of existing protocols, including a document outlining the rights of, caretake, uh, of caretakers, including the right to legal representation that are physically given by our workers. Is this bill achieving something different, or is it simply codifying these existing protocols? Is the bill's intent to have an attorney accompany our caseworkers during any and all possible contacts with caretakers? Or does our worker inform the caretaker and wait for an attorney to arrive? Time in identifying exigent circumstances are critical in ensuring the safety of our children. If there is a wait for an attorney, are we expecting our workers to wait and delay any action, or are we expecting our workers to go to another location and face similar delays? Given the workload with critical safety concerns of our children, we are troubled by the prospect of delay cases and investigations when children's lives are at stake. There are many existing federal, state, and local laws that mandate actions based on visits and investigations, and this bill may run afoul with the existing laws. We are also troubled by the possibility of caretakers hiding behind the request for legal representation to delay or hide circumstances that may lead to our workers taking action immediately. Another unintended consequence of this bill may occur long after the investigatory stages. If a case goes to a court hearing and the initially assigned attorney is called to testify, on the condition of a child or home, is the attorney expected to break attorney-client privilege and possibly incriminate the caretaker? Certain conditions of a child or home may be active criminal neg neglect or uh, so per attorney ethics and duties. Aren't they obligated to report an active crime or the possibility of crimes that may be committed in the future? I want to reiterate the union's commitment to working with this body to ensure that rights are properly exercised without negatively impacting the safety of our children. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you, and we will take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Susan. Thanks. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I think in the interest of time, we'll, 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 take our, we'll do a question online. Michelle, do you have any testimony that you want to Or is that? Okay. Great. Thank you very much for this panel.
Next panel we'll call up is Alisa McCoy, Nicole White. Karina Farmer, and Mashon Baines. Whoever wants to begin. Red light needs to be on. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Karina Farmer. I'm a parent leader at RISE. Allowing a parent to know their rights in, up front and having legal, legal representation during the investigation process will prevent the parents' rights from being violated. Parents aren't aware that their rights are being violated which is causing unnecessary removal of children. Having legal representation, a lawyer or, and parent advocate can help families receive the services they need to stay together to prevent unnecessary trauma, which causes mental health problems. And the parent and child, being taken to foster care unnecessarily destroys the family's bond and two will, re will prevent ACS from using intimidation tactics like calling the police to harass and enter the family's home, which violates the family's constitutional rights. We need data on emergency removals to prevent trauma. In my experience, knocks on the door have caused my children to hide in the closet, and they don't even want to talk to ACS workers. The family could be asking for help, but the agency will use that against them. The AGC has access to services to help the families, for example, food, clothes, furniture, homemaking services, housing, therapeutic services, and also school resources for the children that will help the family thrive, which is the best for the family, instead of causing unnecessary trauma to the children that they are trying to protect. I just know by passing this package of bills will change a lot for the families. And having a parent advocate present during the first contact will help protect the rights of parents and ensure the safety of the child. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if you could hear me. OK. Hi, my name is Elisa McCoy, and I'm here as a parent. And I just want to let you know that uh, if I had a parent advocate at the onset of this investigation, I would have known my rights. I was, this is the first I've ever seen of any pamphlet or anything. Uh, I've been, I've met with ACS before during my divorce and custody, but never in, in, in baseless accusations. Um, basically, ACS has been harassing me, still ongoing. And I say the word harass, I say it with conviction, because any medical issues I have or is, is cancer, which is a direct result from the World Trade Center 9-11. I'm a cancer survivor, and by choosing to take radiation and chemotherapy and surgeries to save my life and the side effects that came with it, ACS had decided to attack my mental, my mental stability at the time relentlessly. They still will not let go. When I had clear medical data proof to show them, they ignored the fact I have an attorney, ran imminent risk, refusing to answer any questions as to what the allegations are. My children were never at risk. Uh, my children are now 19 and two 17-year-olds. I am still undergoing this. This started when they were 14. They will not close my case. I have been forced to exhaust all my financial resources given to me by the 9-11 World Trade Center Victim Fund to remove my name from the SCR. I am still fighting them. The decisions, everything. My finances are almost exhausted due to this process that is very one-sided. ACS polices itself, and when you challenge them and hold them accountable, they come back at you tenfold. I am living proof of this. I have a supporting documentation for absolutely every interaction that I've had with them. I have a paper trail, like my parent advocate told me, to, to keep to hold them accountable. But yet, they're still not accountable. Till this day, I get phone calls, it's closed. 
my children almost full, full grown. The reason I'm going to tell you, I found out off the record, they will not close my, my case. They have absolutely no reason at this point, I have no interaction, we said goodbye. Why is it I cannot get a reason? I don't know. I don't know, I couldn't find out. And I, I'm challenging everything, they will not let me go. And maybe it is because I'm white. They're, from my understanding, that's, I'm just a checkbox. When I saw the amount of people that were on in, this, in my investigation, which need not be over 100 people have worked on my case, where there need not have been any, had they have just verified my attorney at the time, from the onset, verified my World Trade Center cancer, which is public knowledge, or from the health HHS, and which I allowed them to see the Sloan Kettering, the radiation, I was still recovering from the chemo and the radiation at the time of the investigation. They ignored it and ran amok with whatever narrative they needed to twist it. I didn't know that they could possibly go that far based on false allegations. And what I'm still trying to clear my name to this day, and I've spent thousands, in the hundred, a lot of money, a lot of money trying to clear my name. I continue to do it. I want to hold them accountable. I wanted to ask Mr. Hansel, why is it I can't get my case closed today? Why couldn't we have those minutes from that board meeting? Is it because I'm just a checkbox in a percentage? Are my children, I'm gonna stay in, this, in their system without any actual contact by anyone until my children are 18 so they can justify whatever it is that is going on. I just want to hold, I want transparency and accountability. Had somebody have said, you have the right to an attorney right from the onset, I would have not even had a conversation with them knowing it can get this far into court. Mm -hmm. I have a legal background. I'm representing myself at this point because I have exhausted my refunds. Mm -hmm. And my former attorney is now a sitting Supreme Court judge in, in New York. Mm -hmm. Okay, he took me as far as he can get me knowing that this is just an ongoing harassment of 9-11 certified cancer survivor. That's all I'm trying to do. And the choices are made. I made the choices to live by taking the treatment. And ACS's contention is I made bad choices in my life. Not drugs, not anything else, no abuse, no abuse of anything, but attacking my mental stability when my real medical issues were cancer, direct resort from 9-11, and I couldn't be documented any further. To this day, I'd like to ask, can someone please find out to me how I can get my case closed? Because mandates are internal <clears throat> policies that ACS will not tell you what they are. Mm -hmm. from my research, because I'm not going to stop until I get my name cleared. I, would, I have a loving mother, I've never abused my children, neglected inadequate guardianship or whatever it is that I was accused of. I was never told, mm -hmm. never anything. And like I said, the ACS caseworkers, if you do question them, they come back at you tenfold. And that's what's happened to me, okay. just to let you know. Thank you, if I can get an answer and a close out letter, that would be lovely. I'm in Staten Island, there's absolutely no representation, but a parent advocate from, actually she works for ACS, yep. after numerous contacts with the mayor, I got a response nine months into my case, and she gave me the knowledge we, I needed, helped yeah. me navigate the system. We could follow up with you after the Please, after the thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Shaquana yeah. Green is a great parent advocate, she works mm -hmm. for ACS. Got it, got it. Yeah. She's wonderful. We could follow up with you. Thank you, yeah. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Nicole White. Um, in January of 2016, I had a fair hearing to clear my name in Goshen, New York, where I used to live. But I live in Brooklyn now. I had stated to the, uh, the hearing officer I couldn't make the long trip to upstate New York. I didn't have the car fare for trains and cabs. I'm handicapped. I have osteopenia and fibromyalgia. I'm in the process of getting a motorized wheelchair. My lawyer is helping me with that situation. I had called family court here, down here, to have the hearing done by Skype, video, or phone. No one scheduled me a hearing within the city. My name ended up on the SCR list for neglect. My, I had no legal representation to help me with this fair hearing. I called everyone in the Bar Association here in the city and Orange County. No one knew what I was talking about. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. All I needed was legal representation. I, I have battled 
and conquered uh, drug addiction. I've battled and conquered homelessness, and I'm tr in the process of battling to get my name removed off the SCR list. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we're happy to also follow up with you after this hearing. Thank you so much to this panel, uh, and thank you for staying, and happy Halloween, and I wish you all very well. Um, um, Nija Leek, Shamari Ward, Rachel Stanton, Betsy Kramer, Jessica Prince, Brian Holbrook, and Chris Gottlieb. That's And Andrew Ford. Okay. Whoever wants to begin, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll swap out chairs to the microphone. Thanks. Oh, we can go? Yep. We may as well just go left to right, your left to right. So, we can start. Yeah. Sorry. I'm Betsy Kramer from Lawyers for Children, and I'm actually going to cede my time to Shamari Ward from the Legal Aid Society, but I'm available to answer questions. Great. Okay. I'm Rachel Stanton from the Children's Law Center, and we will do the same. Okay. And good afternoon. My name is Shamari Ward. Uh, I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. We represent the majority of children whose parents are charged with abuse and neglect in family court, um, approximately 39,000 children each year. I am presenting testimony on behalf of the Legal Aid Society, Children's Law Center, and Lawyers for Children. We thank, the ch we thank Chair Levin, as well as the Progressive Caucus, for the introduction of these bills and for organizing today's hearing. I will not read our full testimony, but encourage the Council to read it. Uh, we support these bills with some proposed amendments laid out in more detail in our written testimony. First, the importance of making critical information available to parents and children is beyond obvious. Uh, as the Council is well aware, ACS investigates a disproportionately high number of poor black and brown families across the city. Uh, these vulnerable community members need accessible, accurate information regarding their rights and responsibilities throughout an ACS investigation where their most basic fundamental rights, a right, uh, family's right to remain together, are at issue. Um, I just want to point out that there was some mention of a parent's guide, and that parent's guide, um, the ACS parent's guide, explains the process, but not the, it doesn't explain the rights of parents and children, of families essentially. And when, you know, the, the guide also says if you need more info, uh, that you should speak to ACS, which, you know, causes, causes issues that I don't need to explain at this time. In addition to calling on AC, uh, OCFS to, cre to create a parent's bill of rights, the resolution should also call for a children's bill of rights to be provided at initial, investiga uh, at initial investigative contacts with children. 
The Children's Bill of Rights should also be available uh, in age and developmentally appropriate versions. Uh, second, we also support the bill, uh, the bills to provide parents with representation at the outset of an ACS investigation. However, children must be uh, provided the same important support at some stage of the investigation as well. Uh, while ACS characterizes the conversations at the knock on the door as a social worker uh, conversation or a social work conversation, uh, those conversations have real legal consequences. And what's said often becomes the legal basis for findings, so it's not just the parents who see it as um, adversarial, who see the interaction as adversarial, but the system itself centers it as such. Um, as attorneys for children, our experience is indispensable in child welfare matters. Uh, our contribution ensures children's rights are protected and their input is not ignored or misconstrued by ACS, but rather actually considered. We can help identify resources to assist the family and provide other useful information that might uh, not otherwise be elicited. It is important that soon after children have contact with ACS, counsel is available to answer their questions, explain legal terms and processes, and protect their interests. We would note that a pilot in 2005, which provided counsel to children pre-filing, was widely recognized to be a success and only lost funding during a time of great budgetary constraint. We would welcome the opportunity to work with council, uh, the council and other stakeholders to develop, to develop a plan that would be feasible and protect the interests of both parents and children. Uh, we have additional concerns with the bill's uh, current language. As the parents themselves stated, uh, it gives ACS the authority to coordinate counsel for parents during the ACS investigation. This is a, sorry, this is a duty that should be assigned to some entity other than ACS. Having ACS responsible for counsel assignment for parents while investigating them poses a clear conflict of interest. In the current version of Introduction 1728, it is unclear what constitutes the first point of contact as the commissioner pointed out, in, uh, pointed out, in an investigation that would trigger access to counsel, and whether the brief legal assistance that counsel would provide would establish an ongoing attorney-client relationship. We are happy to work with counsel to, with the counsel to address this issue. Third, we support the proposed data collection and reporting bills with some enhancements. The enormity of ACS's authority to remove a child from his or her parents warrants close scrutiny of its practices, particularly in a system rife with dis uh, disproportionate impact on communities of color. By requiring reporting on the exercise of this power and on the frequency of judicial sanction of these removals, these bills would improve oversight of ACS and potentially improve its practice. We additionally propose the reporting obligations include the number of children removed, the ages of those children, and the geographical zone from which they were removed in order to provide information that could assist in identifying problematic practices. We also support Introduction 1717, which would require ACS to report on the demographics of children and families involved in the child welfare system at several important points. We suggest that reported demographic information also should be dis, uh, disaggregated by sexual orientation, gender identity, physical disability, and intellectual disability. In addition, we propose adding the point at which a case is filed to the steps at which ACS is required to provide demographic information. We thank you for working uh, toward protecting the rights of families during child protective investigations. As described above, many of the bills could be strengthened by clarifying their provisions and by adding explicit protections for children. We would be happy to work with the council to craft amendments to the introductions and resolutions to ensure that they are clear and afford adequate protections to both children and their parents. We are happy to answer any questions regarding the testimony. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Got to uh, make sure the red light is on. Got it. Thank you. My name is Chris Gottlieb. I teach child welfare law at NYU Law School, and I have represented hundreds of children and parents whose families have been investigated by ACS. I would like to talk about why passing Bills 1718 and 1736, which some, with some modifications that I will discuss, would be a crucial step towards shifting the culture of child welfare investigations and ending some of the abuses of authority that are all too common in child welfare practice in New York City today. These bills are so important because they will let New Yorkers know that whatever their race or class, they and their children have constitutional rights that no government official is allowed to breach. They are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect whether or not an allegation has been made against them. In 1966, 
the Supreme Court decided the landmark case of Miranda versus Arizona, a case that changed American culture by requiring police to let people know, people they take into custody for interrogation, know their rights. Miranda warnings send a loud and clear message to both the government officials and to the individuals with whom they are interacting that we take every individual's rights seriously. Of course, no one would say the Miranda decision solved the problems of abuse of authority by law enforcement, but the decision was a critical step toward establishing the American commitment to protecting the constitutional rights of every individual. A right simply cannot be meaningful if people don't know they have that right. Today, every American who has watched television knows what his or her rights are when being questioned in custody by the police. In very stark contrast, those who get the knock on their door from ACS almost never know their rights. Perhaps even more dangerous, the ACS staff doing the knocking often don't know the rights of the people into whom's, whose homes they are walking. Or worse, they know those rights and misrepresent what they are. Everyone knows that a warrant, that is a judicial order, is necessary to allow the police to enter someone's home. Why does ACS so often act as though it is not true for their staff when legally it is? I have spoken to countless parents who have said that an ACS worker told them they had no choice but to do exactly what the worker directed them to do. Our system of checks and balances is broken in New York because we allow ACS to act as though they can require people to do anything they want without first securing a court order. Of course, when there is a court order to do so, a family needs to allow ACS in, just as the police would have the right to come in if they have judicial authorization. And of course, there are emergency situations in which an ACS employee might have to take intrusive action without a court order. The law already has safeguards that allow these actions when necessary, but those situations are far fewer than ACS suggests. It must be kept in mind that the knock on the door can be triggered by anyone at all calling the child abuse hotline. Anyone, including disgruntled neighbors, landlords, acrimonious ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, and they can call anonymously, claiming whatever they want without leaving their name. We must also remember that when we talk about parents' rights, we are talking about children's well-being. Witnessing their parents' rights disrespected, realizing their relationships with their parents are vulnerable to govern abuse can be deeply traumatic to children. This committee knows all too well that that is a trauma that we are inflicting on certain communities and not others, on certain children and not others. Parents in the communities most directly affected and advocates for those families are urging that the language of these two bills be modified to ensure that New Yorkers who are investigated by ACS are informed of their most important rights. It is absolutely critical that the law specify the rights people must be informed of, rather than leaving it to ACS to decide when and whether and which rights to mention. These bills should include the rights every parent needs to know at the outset of an ACS case, which are, number one, the right to not let ACS staff into your home absent a court order. Number two, the right to know the allegations against you. Number three, the right to remain silent and to know that anything you say can be used against you. Four, the right to seek legal representation during an ACS investigation. Five, the right of a parent to decide, absent court order, whether their child will be interviewed or examined. And six, the right absent court order to decline ACS requests, including requests to sign releases or take drug tests. These are rights that belong to all New Yorkers. If they are to be meaningful rights, government officials and the communities they interact with need to know that we have a shared commitment to them. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick follow-up question to that. So a potential rejoinder to that is um, that Miranda is, um, is given upon um, a, like arrest or detainment. Mm -hmm. um, is there an analogous point that you see in the process with ACS that is an appropriate point, or is, or is just knock on the door the, the, best, the best point of con um, to do that? So of course, um, Miranda doesn't apply technically in the civil context. I do cite in my written version of the testimony the Supreme Court cases that I think establish the fundamental rights in this area, which as you mentioned, um, uh, couldn't be more important. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think that in terms of the analogy of the point in time, what's so critical about Miranda is that rights are given to the person at the moment when there is the greatest danger they will be intruded upon. Um, so it's the moment at which the government official is about to ask the person to incriminate themselves, and because of the context, has that um, power dynamic you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the equivalent of that, the most analogous moment to that, is the knock at the door moment. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Nija. I'm a foster child. So can you bring the microphone a little bit closer to your face? Or if you uh, turn it a little bit towards you. Like this? There you go, yep. Okay, hi, I'm a foster child. My name is Nija. I just wanted to um, say thank you and I appreciate the General Welfare Committee and Joyce Mc McMahon for allowing me to speak my truth today. I'm speaking on some of my experiences in foster care. I am a victim of the system by circumstance. I can't read this. You want to you just take a moment? Just take, a moment. take your time. Why don't we let someone else go and maybe take Sure. A okay, just take a minute. You're good. Hi. My name is Jessica Prince, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. At the Bronx Defenders, every day we see the devastating consequences of a child welfare system that is too quick to separate children from their parents and too quick to label parents as neglectful, especially when those parents are from poor communities of color. As practitioners, we bear witness to the harmful, inhumane ways families are treated when they are part of this system. We see families experiencing harm through traumatic family separation, and if not separation, government intrusion and surveillance. These harms cause lasting trauma that far outlive the case. We strongly support the packet of bills before the city council today. Children are safer and families are stronger when parents are made aware of their rights and are given early and meaningful access to legal representation when being investigated by ACS. The bills providing for the reading of Miranda-like rights to the, at the start of an ACS investigation and the right to counsel are critical to protecting the fundamental rights of parents and children to familial integrity. We are so encouraged by the City Council's recognition of this need. My colleagues either have already or will speak to those bills, but I'd like to focus more on the reporting bills that have been introduced. As practitioners, we bear witness to structural inequities as well, egregious economic and racial disparities that mark individuals, families, and entire communities as unfit and trap families in a cycle of child welfare involvement for generations. We see and hear about these harms directly from the parents that we represent in court every day, but it is difficult to convey the true scope of these harms without real transparency. We need ACS to share data that is critical to understand the depth of the harm, to diagnose the causes of that harm, and to fashion meaningful solutions that can actually fix the problem. This is especially important so that the racial inequities in the system can be understood and addressed. The commissioner repeatedly said in his testimony today that there are historical, that there's a history of racial, dis, racial disproportionality that racial disproportionality continues to exist today and will continue to exist until we fix the problem. There is racial disproportionality that exists at every single stage of the system. It exists in the way cases are reported to the SCR. We see this with the drug testing of pregnant women in hospitals. Black women are far more, women of color are far more likely to be tested and we even see data that says that black women, when they test positive, are 10 times more likely to be reported to child welfare authorities than white women. Once the case is marked as indicated, we also see that or the cases that are marked as indicated are far more likely to be children that are black so, or, or children of color. This disproportionality also exists for removals and foster care placements. 
Black children are far more likely to be removed from their parents, and once they're removed, they will spend more time separated from their families, they will change foster care placement more frequently, they are less likely to receive necessary services while in care, they are less likely to ever reunify with their families, and are more likely to age out of foster care without being adopted. While we know that these disparities exist at every level of the system, we lack an effective mechanism to hold ACS accountable. And the self-review described by the commissioner today is not enough to fix that problem. The bills that require enhanced reporting about ACS emergency removal practices, foster care placements, and family demographics will, will expose this racial disproportionality and help the city to address the harm. It will help expose the ACS practices that cause and perpetuate it. The Bronx Defenders commends the City Council on its efforts, and we are excited to continue to work with you on these problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, in 2009, my father died of a heart attack, and I can't read this. Do you want to just talk and just say something without reading? You don't even have to read it. You can speak from the heart, or you, it's, um, you know, I know it's, it's uh, a little nerve-wracking in front of, in public, but you're here. You're good. Sure, however you want to do it. So I'm going to read it for her. Okay. Um, I'm a victim of the system by circumstance. It was in 2009 when my father died of a heart attack and around 2003 when my mother passed from a car accident. I've been placed in close to eight to 10 homes and three group, group homes in the span of seven and a half years. During this process, I went not alone into the system, but with two of my brothers, and I was snatched away from them when the workers told us that they, would separate, that they wouldn't separate us. Upstate to a group home, I went while they were in the Bronx at the time where 100 miles away, where we were 100 miles away. But now my little brother was taken to Miami, adopted, and now never heard from again. Someone I grew up with, love and cherish more than myself. I was supposed to protect my little brother. The system didn't give me a chance. Just when I felt there couldn't be no more pain. Throughout dealing with this, I was placed in homes, in little rooms with, with three beds, kicked out five o'clock in the morning with an infant, rain, sleet, snow. They said they never cared. They got paid anyways as they kicked me and my newborn out because I was unwanted. My daughter wasn't 10 hours old before ACS. Sorry. My daughter wasn't 10 hours old before ACS came to my hospital room and gave me a paper and said I'm under a 30 day investigation. Oh, so now I'm not just a foster child, but an unfit mother. I've had been punched and beaten in group, group homes. I have been robbed and screamed at by unknown strangers that I have no choice to stay with. I wore shoes that didn't fit. I was often unfed and watched others eat and throw the scraps I have, scraps. I have written statement to a, to a system that never cared. I've been told I'm sick, been forced to take medication prescribed by its system so-called fine so it's system so-called finest doctors because i've been affected by my circumstances am i not supposed to hurt from all of my all i have lost they showed me it's better for me to be zombified than actually understand the unjust the mentors in the homes love in the homes loved saying better it's better it's that or the psych ward they said as i ate the pills and felt wiry Foster home to foster home, group to group I went. I often ask myself, aren't budget cuts for us to have clothes? 
why do we have to mop and wipe floors and make sure it's shined to have the bare necessities? Why, when you go to the supervisors, they don't hear you, just turn the blind eye? All we wanted was help. All I wanted was understanding and guidance and clean clothes and a warm home. I'm hoping this accountability package brings real accountability and real change. Thank you. Thank you, Nija, for that very powerful testimony. I think it's important that we all acknowledge that and reflect on that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ford, and I'm a senior staff attorney at the Center for Family Representation. I want to take this time to speak about the importance of parents having access to counsel during ACS investigations. To do that, I want to address some common misconceptions about the role of parent attorneys in the child welfare process. First, parents' attorneys are concerned with the best interests of children. It is our job to advise our clients on how to best achieve their goals. And because our clients are parents, and parents are committed to the well-being of their children, our objectives is to keep their children safe and at home permanently. Second, opponents of parents having attorneys during the ACS investigation stage often raise concerns about the process becoming too litigious. However, there are already attorneys involved in the process. They just work for ACS. Many ACS caseworkers have received interrogation skills training from NYPD officers, and these caseworkers frequently reach out to ACS attorneys for advice on whether they need more information from the parent before closing a case, indicating it, or filing a petition. These are investigations, not simple visits. Investigations could lead to removals of children, petitions being filed, orders of protection being sought, and parents being split up when one parent is asked to leave the family home. Parents are not informed of any of these potential outcomes during the investigations. It is rare that parents are even made aware that not only do they not have to speak with ACS, but they don't have to allow their children to speak with ACS or be examined by ACS employees either. When the stakes are so high, and when so much information is withheld, it is no wonder so many parents mistrust ACS. Contrary to the testimony offered by the administration earlier today, access to counsel does not necessarily result in further, uh, further litigation. I must reference a pilot program in 2004 and 2005 called Project Engage. Further information on that is within our written testimony. It was a unique partnership between CFR and ACS that supported parents. In that pilot, where ACS referred a small number of parents to CFR staff in the investigative stage, 80% were able to avoid a removal or a filing in family court. We also want to note that any parent with means would immediately seek legal advice if ACS contacted them. There is no question that they would be entitled to do so. However, most parents who are investigated by ACS are not of means. 82% of our clients are people of color, and 100% of them are poor. So to say that parents who are investigated by ACS should not have access to assigned counsel during these investigations is a decision that disproportionately impacts low-income black and brown families. To oppose parents being informed of their rights or being assigned attorneys during ACS investigations is, in practice, a denial of their rights. That approach should be soundly rejected, and we believe that, with the appropriate amendments, passage of these bills will achieve that. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Holbrook. On behalf of Brooklyn Defender Services, I'd like to thank the General Welfare Committee and the Progressive Caucus 
for the opportunity to provide our thoughts on this groundbreaking legislation to better hold New York City's Administration for Children's Services accountable and to address the disparities in our city's child welfare system. We support this package of legislation and our written testimony includes our views and recommendations on each of these bills. We particularly agree that all New York City parents should receive a parent's bill of rights at the outset of a child protective investigation and we'd emphasize the need for this information to be provided in writing in the parent's primary language and in terms that are simple and easy to understand regardless of a parent's educational level or intellectual capacity. I want to focus primarily on the importance of parents getting access to lawyers and advocates as early in the child protective investigation as possible before a case is filed in court. Currently, most parents with child welfare involvement do not have access to attorneys until ACS files a case against them in family court. Prior to the case coming to court, including at child safety conferences convened by ACS, critical decisions are made that have significant consequences for how the case will proceed, including the programs and services that the family, family will be mandated to participate in, whether the case will be filed in court, and most significantly, whether children will be separated from their parents. Parents generally participate in these investigations and intend pre-filing child safety conferences alone without the advice of counsel or advocates to guide them through the process. This results in many family separations and court filings, which might have been avoided if parents had access to legal and social work assistance. I'd like to share a couple of examples about the transformative impact that early defense can have for families. BDS represents a client whom I'll call Gina, who's the mother of four children. She was arrested for leaving her four-year-old son at a police precinct for 20 minutes when her usual family support was unable to help. The day after her case was arraigned in criminal court, a BDS team of attorneys, paralegals, and social workers prepared Gina for her ACS involvement and then advocated at a child safety conference to keep the case out of family court. BDS advocated for ACS to provide support services for the whole family instead of removing the children. The night before the conference, ACS had asked Gina to leave the kids with a family resource, which she did, but at the conference, with BDS's advocacy, ACS agreed for the children to return home with services in place and never even filed a court case. BDS also advocated for two parents whose baby was born with withdrawal symptoms from the mother, whom I'll call Sarah, using Suboxone to treat her addiction to opioids. Sarah did not have access to a prescription, and she was using Suboxone without a prescription because she knew it was safer than continuing her opioid use. ACS saw her use of a Suboxone to treat her addiction as continuing drug-seeking behavior. A BDS social worker attended the child safety conference and explained how Sarah was focused on her recovery and had the support of her baby's father. BDS advocated for this family to stay together and helped ACS see that the mother just needed to be connected to the right services and was already working on her recovery. Through BDS's advocacy, the family avoided a court case and family separation, and Sarah was able to get the services she needed to continue her recovery. So um, I think Council Member uh, Traeger raised earlier that many of the child protective specialists, the majority, do not have social work training. They're not licensed social workers. Um, so the testimony from Deputy Commissioner Davidson regarding how these interactions with the parent at the knock on the door, at family team meetings, at child safety conferences are done in a social work um, Milo is, is really not our experience at all. These are very adversarial proceedings. As I think Andrew mentioned, these child protective specialists are trained as investigators, as interrogators, by sometimes by the police department. So the idea that these are, um, you know, worker to parent um, friendly interactions is, I think, um, a real misrepresentation of what's going on, and it emphasizes the need for parents to have advocates in their corner and just to answer questions about the process. Um, I'll also say that in the early defense we worked, we do currently, far from treating it as an adversarial litigation posture, we are primarily focused on answering parents' questions. That can include advising a parent not to share private information that has nothing to do with the report that's in front of ACS, but it can also include advising the parent that a certain amount of cooperation with ACS, particularly if the concerns are not very serious, may be the very quickest way to get the case um, closed without ever uh, going to court. So we thank the council for induce, introducing legislation that could ensure that all parents who are confronted with the government's power to separate or intervene in families' lives have access to early defense services. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. 
Thank you for having this hearing and for the opportunity to testify on these important issues. My name is Ayami Hatanaka, and I'm a parent advocate at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. In my role, I work with parents as an out-of-court advocate and work on a team with each client's attorney. I also represent clients at administrative hearings for their appeals regarding the State Central Registry. And today, I will specifically focus on how the State Central Registry impacts parents in Harlem and how the proposed bills could help create a more equitable process. A few weeks ago, I sat in the waiting area of the special hearing section of the state building of 125th Street with my client sitting next to me. I had thoroughly prepared my client and we had discussed what our strategy for the hearing would be as well as potential outcomes. I worked hard to put together our evidence and to prepare for the hearing. As we waited, I noticed a man next to us. He was by himself without a lawyer or advocate. The agency lawyer, his adversary in this proceeding, came out and asked whether he would be presenting evidence at his own hearing. This man, who did not appear to understand English, attempted to answer through an interpreter, but it was unclear to me whether the man understood the question or what the process would be or even look like. There was no significant difference between my client and this man. Both of them should have had access to knowledgeable representation that could help them navigate the difficult process of a hearing. And yet my client was represented by an advocate under the supervision of an attorney. I would posit that no one here in this room would attend a legal hearing, such as an SCR hearing, without legal representation. I am in no way undermining the importance of parents' voices and perspectives, but there is no reason one person should not have access to the resources of representation while another person does. Furthermore, individuals whose cases do not end up in family court, but are still investigated and marked as indicated in the state central registry should have the same opportunity and access to representation at a hearing as well. Proposed laws 1715, 1729, and resolution 1066 are a way for city council to take direct action to right this wrong. It is important to note that having an indicated case in the SCR can create significant barriers to employment for up to 28 years. That is the majority of time for a person's career. This issue disproportionately affects low-income black and brown communities and inflicts severe economic consequences, keeping families in poverty and at high risk of continued ACS involvement because of the conflation between poverty and neglect. Although the trauma of family separation will forever affect a family, the weight of having one's name on the SCR with an indicated case can be removed through a more just and fair process. The proposed laws are a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much to this panel. I look forward to working with all of you in the coming weeks and months uh, to look at this legislation. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna call up um, two more panels. And again, wanna be sensitive to time here, so. Um, the quickest we could get through it would be the best, I think. Melissa Moore, Drug Policy Alliance, Arlene Rodriguez, Mobilization for Justice, Juliet Davis, Children's Defense Fund, Marilene Mena, Children's Committee, Citizens, Children, Citi Citizens Committee for Children, and Tasfia Rahman, Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Marilyn Mena, and I am the Policy and Budget Analyst at Citizens Committee for Children of New York. CCC is a 75-year-old, independent child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Thank you, Chair Steve Levin, and all the members of the General Welfare Committee for holding today's hearing. The bills reviewed today take critical steps towards ensuring child safety and permanency. I will highlight what CCC views as three priorities. First, prioritizing child safety. Second, strengthening families and keeping them together when possible. And last, system accountability and reporting to better meet the needs of children and families. CCC's research suggests that the most effective child welfare system is one that prevents abuse or neglect from occurring in the first place. An effective child welfare system also prevents the need for foster care when there is risk by providing services that support families. Supporting families during a time of vulnerability prevents the trauma of removal 
while also strengthening a family's ability to provide a safe home for their child. To that end, CCC's advocacy has focused on ensuring that child welfare financing supports um, preventive services. However, when a child is in danger, there must be a proper system in place to protect them. When CPS investigations are necessary, we must ensure that the system can respond in a manner that minimizes further trauma and harm to the child or children. Allegations of abuse and neglect are serious and child safety is the agency's first responsibility. At the same time, parents' rights are critical and must be protected as an, uh, sorry, as an additional measure for child and family stability and well-being. Child Protective Services investigations can have long-term consequences for a parent or caregiver and their child or children. For these reasons, CCC supports parents' rights to legal representation. Without question, it is imperative for families to know their rights, and in particular, their right to counsel. As it relates to intro 1728, CCC has significant concerns about the logistical feasibilities and, challenge, and challenges to, uh, to implementation despite the positive intent of the bill. Several partners in ACS have raised concerns regarding the potential of this bill to dramatically change the nature of ACS involvement by making the investigation process more adversarial and potentially resulting in greater numbers of removals and compromised safety as well as perman permanency goals. And yet research examining the combined use of peer advocates, social workers and attorneys and, and interdisciplinary teams to represent parents has demonstrated positive outcomes in child welfare cases. Perhaps, perhaps best practices can be replicated in, in these efforts with greater examination. Recently, City Council funded a pilot that also supports early access to legal representation. CCC urges careful review of findings and outcomes from early and current models to inform how the bill might be strengthened. As it relates to intro 1728, we humbly ask the committee to consider the following. When and by whom would counsel be assigned? What would be the duration of representation? What protections and assurances will be put in place to ensure timely fact finding? Um, who holds these contracts? CCC strongly believes that the responsibility of counsel should sit with an independent entity, entity outside of ACS. Who gets to bid for these contracts? It is imperative that there be a standard of expertise required in both child welfare and family court policy for contracts to be awarded. Lastly, CCC has a long history in fact-based advocacy and data-driven methods. We support policy that is grounded on data and support the use of publicly available data to inform policy. To this end, we support Bill 1716, 1717, um, intro 1727 that build on greater systems of accountability and reporting. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Melissa Moore. I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, and just first off, I just want to thank so much everybody who made time to be here today, for those who testified, and especially to Nija for her powerful and incredibly courageous testimony. Um, so Drug Policy Alliance is the nation's leading organization working to advance policies and attitudes to best reduce the harms of both drug use and drug prohibition and to promote the sovereignty of individuals over their minds and bodies. Um, DPA has learned valuable lessons from every campaign in every state um, and we want to ensure that there's relief for those harmed by criminalization and that every agency working to stigmatize and punish people who use drugs moves toward truly embracing harm reduction. Our commitment to ending the war on drugs extends beyond criminal justice reform, and we want to call upon every system to account for their participation in the racist criminalization of people who use drugs. The slate of legislation introduced by the Council is a step toward pushing ACS away from harmful interventions that contribute to family separation. And I just want to acknowledge that um, child welfare system has had an indelible impact on my own family as well, and so I speak from that experience too. Um, with regard to intro 1426, I just want to actually share a portion of testimony from Dr. Misha Turplin uh, that I think is really relevant to this issue. It was submitted earlier this year as part of the marijuana justice package, but I think it's especially uh, relevant right now. Dr. Turplin is a physician boarded in both obstetrics and gynecology and an addiction medicine um, and nationally recognized expert in the care of pregnant people with substance use disorder. Um, he's also a consultant for the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare and serves as a professor of um, multiple dif disciplines that I won't get into now. You can get it all in the written testimony. Um, so when I say I here, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the doctor. Um, the separation of newborns from mothers due to presumptive positive urine drug tests conflicts with physician professional society guidance and recommendations for the appropriate use of urine drug tests. 
from other societies as well. In other words, the practice of separation is not evidence-based. Furthermore, the practice of separation, save extreme and extremely rare circumstances, harms both newborn and maternal health. In other words, the practice of separation is not person-centered. Finally, the practice of separation is unequally applied, affecting primarily poor women and women of color. The practice of separation is discriminatory. I have cared for over 1,000 pregnant women who used cannabis at some point during their pregnancies, and I have never observed anything suggesting that the cannabis use resulted in any harm to the children. Below I will describe the clinical and scientific context that informs this summary statement. The practice of separation for cannabis use during pregnancy is not grounded in the science of outcomes of cannabis use during pregnancy. The scientific literature on cannabis use and its health effects during pregnancy is extensive and includes four prospective cohorts that have followed children exposed to cannabis prenatally into young adulthood, as well as four systematic reviews meta-analyses. Some studies have found no correlation between maternal cannabis use and either pregnancy or child development outcomes, and other studies have demonstrated mostly subtle effects on newborn birth weight or length. However, in these studies, growth differences dissipated after a few months. Taken together, the literature supports at best subtle and likely confounded effects. In other words, the assumption of harm upon which child removal is predicated is not supported by the published scientific literature. And with regard to urine drug testing, the identification of in utero cannabis exposure is almost always determined from a urine drug test. The urine drug tests performed in clinical care on labor and delivery are quick and easy to perform and are considered screening but not diagnostic tests. All screening tests have a false positive rate which is the test is positive, but there's no actual exposure. For cannabis use, a false positive test happens at least 5% of the time. In other words, a positive test suggests but not, does not confirm cannabis use or exposure. And in addition, the metabolite that is tested for in urine drug tests is not delta-9 THC, which is the positive, sorry, which is the psychoactive cannabinoid in cannabis, but rather an inactive and not psychoactive metabolite. The metabolite can be present for weeks following the last use. Um, so I'll just skip ahead a little bit um, to note that urine drug testing requires explicit consent prior to collection as determined by the Supreme Court decision in Ferguson versus City of Charleston in 2001. Um, and Dr. Turplin testified, I've reviewed many hospital consent forms and have yet to encounter one where a consent for urine drug testing was not buried within multiple pages of other general consent language. As clinicians, our ethical obligation is to explain the reason for tests to patients and how the results will be used. I've reviewed many medical records of patients who were separated from their infants due to presumptive positive urine drug tests and have yet to see one in which a transparent consent conversation was documented. In short, the current practice of urine drug testing on labor and delivery is unethical. Just quickly, in summary, um, with regard to intro 1426, uh, the New York Health and Hospital Corporation's policy and procedure regarding screening a pregnant person for alcohol use and exposure to other drugs requires the medical provider to obtain ver verbal consent prior to delivering a drug test. The pregnant person must also be informed of how the results will be used for her medical care and the care of the unborn or newborn child. It's unclear as to how this policy is implemented, as there is no data on the breadth of drug testing and the number of pregnant people reported to the SCR as a result of positive toxicology. While the proposed policy does, does address the lack of transparency in ACS, it doesn't address the problem of drug testing people without informed consent and the drug testing of newborns without any consent whatsoever from the parents. DPA asks that the council not only support reporting legislation as you have, but also challenge the use of drug testing on pregnant people prior to delivery or the testing of newborns postpartum. The resolution introduced um, earlier this year asking the State Department of Health to create clear regulation is significant, but the council can and should use its oversight power to take action to address New York City hospitals as well. In New York, black pregnant people and newborns are more likely to be screened for prenatal drug exposure than white pregnant people. While the screening of black pregnant people and babies does occur at higher rates, white pregnant people and children screened for drug exposure are more likely to test positive for drug exposure. This is not an invitation for health and hospitals to test for more pregnant people, but rather for them to assess the criterion for testing so that screening decisions support the long-term health and wellness of the parent and child. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Arlene Rodriguez. I am a senior staff attorney with the Kinship Caregiver Law Project at Mobilization for Justice. 
The Kinship Caregiver Law Project represents grandparents, other relatives, and fictive kin who take care of children whose birth parents are deceased, incarcerated, or otherwise unable or unwilling to care for the children. MFJ and the Kinship Caregiver Law Project works to prevent these children from entering the traditional foster care system by representing caregivers in custody, guardianship, and adoption proceedings. Uh, we thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. While we do support all of the measures, we do want to highlight some that are specific to kinship caregivers, specifically Bills 1715, 1728, and Resolution 1066. For our clients, SCR background checks are often conducted under emergency circumstances. A related child has been removed from their parents, and the state needs to clear the relative's home before placing the child with them. Under such circumstances, the existence of SCR history can mean the difference between the child going to a familiar and comforting home with family members and the child entering the traditional foster care system with complete strangers. Unfortunately, we regular encounter, regularly encounter caregivers who are unaware that an SCR finding was ever entered against them at all because they never had to go to court, because there was no ongoing ACS intervention or their child was not removed from their care, or because words like indicated and unfounded were never explained to them. With no access to counsel, caregivers struggle through the process of challenging allegations or clearing their SCR history. People are often provided incomplete information or no information at all. They have they may have a language barrier or lack the resources to even attend fair hearings. Providing for caregivers to consult with legal counsel at the outset of ACS involvement will inform people of their rights and the steps that SCR hearings entails. Providing counsel throughout the proceedings would drastically change the outcome of these investigations. This would result in ju judicial economy as well as potentially, potentially altering outcomes for families for generations. I would also like to briefly speak to Resolution 1066. Reducing the length of time an individual has a case on the SCR would vastly alter the lives of thousands of New Yorkers. I would like to brief or to focus, I'm sorry, on um, the indicated cases. As this committee knows, the length of time that SCR findings stay on an individual's record is dependent not only on the age of the subject child, but upon the age of other children in the home at the time of the investigation. An indicated case will not be expunged until the youngest child in the home at the time of the investigation turns 28 years old, regardless of whether or not that specific child was impacted by the allegations. This directly and negatively impacts kinship caregivers. I'd like to offer an example of a client that we worked with. Ms. Kay came to mobilization for justice last year for help. Ms. Kay had cared for her infant grandson and his older siblings on and off for most of their lives. However, when the child's mother moved to New York City with the uh, infant from upstate and relapsed, unfortunately, into substance use, ACS removed the child from her care and placed the child into the child welfare system. Although Ms. Kay, Ms. Kay immediately stepped forward to have her grandson placed with her, her home was denied placement due to an SCR finding against a household member from 1991. Ms. Kay came to us a year after the denial when the youngest child named in the SCR investigation had finally turned 28. Unfortunately, by that time, Ms. Kay's grandson had bonded with the unrelated foster family and the court determined that it would be too dr traumatic to, mo to move him again. Because the indicated case had remained in the SCR for nearly the full 28-year maximum, Ms. Kay's grandson ended up permanently estranged from his grandmother and siblings. It's also worth noting that the siblings were not removed from Ms. Kay's home and no safety concerns were ever identified regarding her home. We have submitted more expansive written testimony, um, and I thank this committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Tasfia Rahman and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Thank you, Chair Levin, for holding this hearing and giving us the opportunity to testify. For the past three decades, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American APA population has been rapidly growing, um, currently at 1.3 million people. Despite our rapid population growth, these 
um, APAs are often not connected to vital social services and seen as a lower priority for attention and resources, especially in the child welfare system. Consider almost a quarter of Asian Americans live in poverty in New York City. Asian Americans are heavily immigrant with 70% being foreign born. Asian Americans also have the highest rate of linguistic isolation of any group in the city at 42%, meaning that no one over the age of 14 in the household speaks English well. This data, although helpful in beginning to paint an accurate picture of, of our community needs, is mostly aggregate and fails to shed light on various unique struggles among specific Asian ethnic communities. Many times we are not accurately counted and our needs remain misunderstood and unaddressed. Um, as reported by many APA families um, that support the community, uh, APA families still face the following barriers in navigating the child welfare system. Language, many APA and other immigrant communities who come into contact with the child welfare system struggle with limited English proficiency. Um, culture, APA families may engage in child rearing and disciplinary practices that reflect the cultural norms, their countries of origin, but are considered potentially harmful here. And finally, lack of familiarity. APA families are often uninformed about child welfare laws. The role of ACS or the availability of resources at at-risk families. For undocumented families, this lack of familiarity is exacerbated by fear that interacting with government agencies will result in punitive action or even deportation. Um, we are supportive of the packet of legislation that is on review today, but we would like to highlight particular issues. For example, um, in intro 17, 16, 17, and 19, um, should be thought, enacted in, in order to ensure that the unique needs faced by the range of APA communities are assessed accurately. We do highlight the importance of disaggregation to avoid oversimplifying and um, further misunderstandings of our communities. Um, 1718, we are really emphasized by and should be implemented by guaranteeing that the diverse and the vast language needs of the APA community are met in order to help parents and avoid culturally based um, misinterpretation between ACS and families. And just broadly, I'd like to highlight that there is an existing cultural gap um, and it becomes compounded in this very anti-immigrant climate. And that um, while our community organizations have taken the role of being cultural brokers, there does need to be all around um, collaboration, including ACS and our communities to make sure that these cultural gaps are bridged. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, all for your testimony. Um, we're gonna uh, take it all under advisement and uh, we have your written testimony, uh, expanded written testimony for the record. So we greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay, final panel. Zachary Ahmad, New York Civil Liberties Union, Stephen Forrester, the New York Society for Prevention uh, of Cruelty to Children, Marsha uh, Kresge, Kresge, ATD, Fourth World Movement, and uh, Corita Coles from Girls for Gender Equity. And then if anyone else wishes to testify, um, please fill out a form with the Sergeant at Arms. What was, I'm sorry, what is your name? Oh, I called you before. Yes, but if you wanna, if you wanna join this, okay, yeah. No, no, you can join this, test, this, this panel. Sorry, I called you, yeah, I think it was a few panels back. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Make sure the light is on. Light. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Forrester and I'm the Director of Government Relations and Administration at the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The M NYSPCC was founded in 1875 as the world's first child protective agency here in Manhattan. For more than 140 years, the NYSPCC has been at the forefront of the effort to keep children safe and to support their families in raising their children to be healthy and productive adults. The NYSPCC currently provides numerous clinical and other services to children and families in New York City, including a therapeutic supervised visitation program and a trauma recovery, recovery clinic for children who have uh, been severely sexually or physically abused. 
the NYSPCC has consistently lent its voice to the fight for improving protective measures for children at the public policy level, such as the recent successful campaign to enact the Child Victims Act in New York State. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard regarding the package of legislative proposals being considered by the City Council regarding the work of the City's Child Protective Agency, the Administration for Children's Services. While many of the proposals in the package seem worthy of consideration and enactment, the NYSPCC would like to respectfully address its concerns regarding one of the proposals, in particular, Intro 1728. This would require ACS to establish a program providing an attorney to parents at the initial point of contact during a child protective investigation. This measure presents numeral, numerous practical difficulties and risks. How will ACS coordinate arrival at the child's home simultaneously with an attorney employed by a wholly independent organization? What if the attorney arrives after the ACS investigator and the child is in an emergency situation that needs an immediate response? Must the investigator wait for the attorney's arrival to intervene? How can ACS disclose the name and the contact information to the, of the family? without violating the confidentiality provisions of the social services law. Aside from these problems, the provision would significantly increase child safety concerns that are self-evident. ACS has a primary obligation to protect the children who are named in the initial report, while secondarily supporting parents in order to help them address child safety issues. Attorneys have only a single ethical imperative, that is, to protect the interest of their client, the parent. The safety of the child is ethically not, the, uh, not the, the attorney's concern at all. If the attorney advises the family not to speak to the investigator or permit entry to the child's home, the likely outcome in most cases, this will result in potentially life-threatening delay in performing the required safety assessment. Additional time and court resources will be needed in order to seek an entry order to the home so that the investigation can move forward. However, the child may be in immediate danger and any delay could pose life-threatening risk. As an advocate for children, the NYSPCC must register its objection to this, this provision as far too risky to visit upon New York City's children. The significant monetary costs associated with 1728 would be far better spent in enhancing program services for families, such as housing assistance, mental health treatment, and child care. We urge the City Council to deeply ponder this provision's potential threat to the safety of New York City's children and to decline its enactment. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marcia Kresge with ATD Fourth World Movement. And I wasn't, um, didn't make a prepared statement because I just found out about this two days ago. And the elements of all the bills on the table are very much what our organization is about, protecting families, protecting people's human rights, especially for people living in extreme poverty. So um, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a social worker, but I think today there were many uh, pros and cons raised. And I think that the right to have a lawyer and that people are aware that they have a right to counsel has been a big push all across the city, whether it's in housing, for people getting displaced by uh, landlords jacking up their rent and they don't know that they can go and fight in court. And they, they get bullied into things. And I, I think that sometimes the members of our organization who have come to our meetings where we talk about the issues of poverty have said that you know, when ACS comes to the door, they don't know that they can say, no, you can't come in. Um, I was trained as a little kid. Well, no, you can't, I don't just let anybody in who says they want to, they have a reason to come into my house. So the right to know that you can get counsel, right to um, get all these statistics, I think is really important for families and to keep families together is been proven in our group that they love each other, they can take care of each other and that we have to work on the problems. The thing that you brought up, 
Mr. Levin, before about uh, the emergency situations is also disturbing. Like it's, it's so hard to know what situation has been reported is a kid that's about to die or is a bruise because, you know, his own parent was drunk and he just carried on. And that even as a citizen, I was a teacher also, and I've, I've been through all the trainings. And it's a one day training that the um, commissioner mentioned is not enough to really understand the full scope of what's going on in family life or in terms of um, abuse and violence and psychological welfare. Um, sometimes I've, I've seen the kids come to class with a bump on their forehead and in, they might have just ran into the coffee table <laughs> over the weekend because they were roughhousing with their siblings. And that's really hard to discern as an outside party. But as a, as a teacher, you're required to report these things. So I think we need more training. And um, I also think that um, there should be more training for the caseworkers because there's a lot of pressure for someone that doesn't have advanced education they're not police officers, um, so we, we have to work on that, I think. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levin, council members, and staff of the New York City Council Committee on General Welfare. Thank you for taking the time to hold this hearing. My name is Quadera Coles, and I am the policy manager at Girls for Gender Equity. GGE is an intergenerational advocacy and youth development organization that is committed to the physical, psychological, social, and economic development of girls and women. GGE is committed to challenging structural forces, including racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, and economic inequality, which constricts the freedom, full expression, and rights of transgender and cisgender girls and women of color and, non and gender nonconforming youth of color. It should be no news to you that girls in foster care experience exasperated um, disadvantages and are systematically marginalized. New York City foster care system disenfranchised black girls. They are more likely to be removed from their familiar environments due to issues of neglect that are often problems arising from poverty, interlocking systems of oppression manifested in housing discrimination, educational in inequities, incarceration, and policing result in black and Latinx family being disproportionately targeted by child welfare agencies. We understand that the overwhelming surveillance and city supervision of black children to together with pervasive stereotypes about criminality and maternal irresponsibility sustain a harmful collaboration between policing and child welfare, well, child welfare systems. In this way, city systems function to punish black families and communities and subsequently blame them for their own marginalization. GGE therefore pushes for systemic reform addressing the inherent issues of racism and sexism within these government service organizations and their policy. GGE firmly believes that every effort should be made to keep girls in their most desired environment and prioritizing their voices throughout the process. GGE works every day to secure the protection and respect of girls of color and gender nonconforming youth, particularly black girls. The child welfare system is riddled with inequity, specifically impacting girls of color. There is unsettling data about the general child welfare system that posits the need for rigorous oversight and management of ACS, for instance. According to national data, black girls make up 22.9 of girls in foster care, 35.6 of girls who move to at least 10 different residential centers are black. School suspension rates differed among, among those in foster care and students who are not. 25% of girls in foster care was suspended compared to the 10% of girls not in foster care. About 30 to 40% of children in foster care qualify for specialized education, educational services, but only about 16 of them receive them. It is not unlikely that trends in New York City mirror these national statistics. GGE strongly recommends that the council require ACS to report out data about racial, racial and gender breakdown of people impacted by ACS investigations, interventions, and removals. While in foster care, girls experience high rates of abuse and sexual violence are more likely to ultimately become involved in the juvenile justice system. Girls in foster care have their education disrupted due to missing early childhood educational opportunities, changing schools, stricter discipline, and push out 
than their peers not in foster care and not receiving IEPs when needed. ACS is finally taking steps to address some of the gender-specific disparities that disproportionately, disproportionately experienced by girls of color in foster care. GGE has been asked to offer city's first ever gender-responsive diversion program from, for girls, young women, and girls in juvenile justice system as an alternative to placement for young people assigned to juvenile detention and otherwise referred by ACS. Thanks to the additional fiscal support by the City Council through the Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative, GGE will be able to provide full scope of services that we know are necessary for girls to not only participate but th thrive in our program. Today, this committee is putting forward a bill package that GGE generally supports with suggestions of small yet important changes. GGE supports efforts to bring greater transparency to disparities at each step in the child welfare system, and we urge the council to ensure that these are public-facing, machine-readable, and easily accessible reports. With regard to intro 1717, we ask that the responsibility to address racial and income disparities in the child welfare system not fall exclusively under, under the purview of ACS. And in reference to the Parents' Bill of Rights, it is crucial that to ensure language access and availability and visibility of these resources. ACS must commit to providing parents, families, and impacted young people greater access to information clarifying their rights. We encourage the adoption of a more aggressive media campaign from ACS to demonstrate good faith efforts in ensuring families know their rights. Thank you, New York City Council, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, and thanks for the great work that Gigi does. Let me turn it on. Hello, I'd like to thank the City Council for having this hearing, and I hope to continue to come to testify. My name is Michonne Baines, and it just seems like as a black mother, like we're penalized for being every woman. And we really, for us to raise our children in this city in this difficult time, it's like we're under a microscope. I became a family advocate in 2004 because I had a case w with ACS for um, corporal punishment, which I did spank my oldest daughter for hanging out at nights, and she was just had wild, erotic behavior. During that time, I did seek help to get my uh, oldest daughter under control and um, couldn't get anything from the school, always in school, Always, uh, I ran for board of, uh, board of Education for the board. So, you know, when it came to education and school things, as a mother, I was an involved parent. ACS came in 2003 with the police department. A uh, worker called me, how's your children? Oh, everything is okay, but I, my daughter has issues, behavior issues, and I would need services for help. Okay, we'll be by to help. Come by with the police department, take all the children five children then. Ever since then, I was very vicious with, with my advocacy because I've seen a lot of families being destroyed, including mine, so I know how it feels. I was an advocate for NAN, National Action Network, under Al Sharpton, CWAP in the uh, cradle, and uh, with Rolando Beanie, Parents in Action, and also with the Undue Racism, which ACS was a part of, and legal aid, and the various of cities, agencies, were supposed to be coming together to address the issue. I want to speak about also FAR. FAR was, um, it was supposed to be some type of monitoring system uh, when a call came in and ACS was involved and parent advocates was involved and they destroyed because it, I heard it was working and they just cut the program. Programs that work, that involves parent advocates, they cut them off short. And you guys fund ACS and, and for programs, but with the programs that work, they get rid of them. Another thing I wanna say is about defamation of character. Uh, through the years, it's like you're targeted as a parent. Any little thing, oh, we're gonna call ACS, especially landlords, which is a weapon now. I don't know if you heard about this. 
Currently, I have a case of neglect for failure to provide stability housing under ACS, which is, I don't understand, how is that possible? I was living in NYCHA, and there was no due process. The grandmother passed away. There was a, a four-bedroom apartment in Douglas Housing. I was assisted to the tenant PT, uh, president, and um, all of a sudden, there was an ACS case we were evicted, rent was paid up, the judge uh, sided with um, NYCHA. How do I get a, um, a ACS case? My children said they did not want to go to shelter. We did go to the shelter. They said it's traumatized, and they went and ran to their mother, which is their grandmother, which is my mother. And so that still needs to be under investigated because I, I don't understand. Matter of fact, ACS get money to help with housing. No one reached out to me for housing. No one notified me about anything. So that has to change because my children are still traumatized. Someone spoke about surveillance. These kids, especially as teenagers, when they're in ACS care, when my children two years ago went back in the system for a failure to provide stability housing, my children never went to school. I went to contact 311 all the time, went to Office of Advocacy, which is Mike who's in charge, who sat on the board with me and many a times around these same issues. Nothing gets done. Children run away. So these things are neglected. I'm neglected, my family is neglected because no one's reaching out to us to help us reunify and keep the family together. That has not happened yet. Defamation of character, I am a clinician. I am also a, a doula, which helped midwives deliver babies, and I plan to go forward as a midwife. Guess what? Because of these um, allegations, false allegations, it diminished my internship in elite hospitals. And I have very good experience and background. So, and that doesn't change. 28 years, they say it stays in the system. I'm suffering, that's not fair to me. So that means it's playing a problem on my income I can't work, <laughs> I can go to school, which I have been going to school and I have not stopped. But how am I supposed to get a job in my field of interest if these cases are lingering around, many adjournments, goes on for years and years and years, no stop, it doesn't close it. So it's just something has to be done and it's destroying families. And I hope something be, is done so it could stop destroying families. And who do you go talk to? Because I've contacted the commissioner's office. I heard everything he said. It is a lie. So I hope you do something about also the increase of black and brown families who are a, a victim of gentrification. ACS is being used as a weapon. Once they take them children out the home, guess what? It makes it much easy to remove the families and the parents and the mothers and the loved ones out these apartments they want so bad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I just want to uh, read really quickly a statement from Councilmember Adrian Adams on uh, intros. 1718 and 1716 on behalf of her. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking Chair Levin for his willingness to deliver these comments on introduction 1715 and 1716 on my behalf. Uh, what do you do if ACS comes to your home? You can tell them that the charges are not true, but they are required to investigate them anyway. However disrespectful and invasive they are, whatever awful things they accuse you of, ACS ultimately has the power to remove your children at any time. Whatever happens later, whether the children come back next week, in six months, or do not come back at all, that moment can never be undone. Families in this city under investigation by ACS lack many basic protections. I am proud to join my colleagues in the Progressive Caucus in this legislative package. We must secure the rights of parents 
who are put under a microscope with little access to information. I'm grateful for today's hearing on intros 1715 and 1716, which I encourage my colleagues to support. Intro 1715 would require ACS to create a program and provide access to legal services for parents and guardians after an indicated report during an ACS investigation, specifically during the fair hearing process. Mm -hmm. Intro 1716 would require ACS to report on the total number of emergency removals desegregated by race, household income, and single parent status. There have been long-standing issues within the ACS system, which have disproportionately affected immigrants, low-income New Yorkers, and people of color across our city. We must do everything possible to prevent unwarranted separations, especially for those who are only guilty of parenting while poor or black or immigrant. We must ensure that this agency improves their policies and protocols to prevent future trauma for families. Sincerely, Adrian Adams, council member. So, thank, thank you all very much for your testimony. Thank you everybody for staying. Happy Halloween. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.